Good morning, everybody. We're just going to kindly ask you to have a seat, please. And we're going to quiet down just a little bit so we can start this amazing event. Buenos dias. Oh, we know. I thought they provided breakfast. Is everybody energized today? <laughs> Buenos dias. So I love to hear a little Spanish in the room. It makes me happy. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Donna G. Esparza. I will be your host today for the economic forecast from the Los Angeles County Economics Development Corporation. Um, I invite, I'm going to do the shameless plug. So I invite you to listen to me Monday through Friday from 10 to 3. Uh, I gladly keep you company while you work through K-Love 107.5. Have you had the chance to listen to it? Amazing music. Please raise your hand. Thank you. <laughs> um, K-Love has over 40 years in this community, providing music, culture, and connection through music and community information. And it has been such a staple of our community as a radio station and as a brand. So we are very excited to be here. There's over 9 million people in LA um, alone in LA County, and we are the number one radio station. So yay for that. Thank you. Um, and you know, we are the radio station. Our community trusts us a lot. So that's such a blessing for us and also such a big responsibility. Univision Televisa owns K-Love, and Univision Televisa is a proud member of the LA EDC. And it's an honor for me to be here today in front of you all to start this event. So thank you so much for coming early this morning. Before I introduce our first speaker, I invite you to look at the center of your table. You're going to see a QR code. We are modernizing everything just a bit. I'm sure everybody is attached to their cell phone. So I invite you to grab your cell phone, open your camera, scan the QR code. The LA EDC values environmental uh, sustainability. And this QR code is going to take you to an amazing link that's going to give you access to today's program, speaker's bio, and the full economic forecast report. So I invite you to please scan it and follow the program along. Because we love our environment and support our green initiative, we um, only have the agenda, the report, and other materials available through the QR code. So please take a moment to scan that code and follow along. We invite you also to join the conversation. Everybody has social media here today, right? No? Don't hide it. <laughs> we it's it's so important nowadays just because we're able to be part of the conversation. So we definitely invite you to be part of this amazing conversation. Follow us via social media at LAEDC hashtag as well and be part of this moment today. And now it's such an honor for me to introduce you to the board chair of the LAEDC, Mr. Siegelson. I, I did not pick my walk-up music, but I, I don't think I could have done any better than that. Thank you, Donna G. It's so cool to be introduced by K-Love. I love it. Thank you very much. And thank you, Univision, for being such a terrific partner uh, to the LAEDC and a valued member of our community. Uh, my name is Steve Olson, and I am the board chair this year of the LAEDC. Um, and I want to remind everyone of the LACD's LAEDC's -E -E mission, which is to reinvent our economy to collaboratively advance growth and prosperity for all. As a 501c3 public benefit organization, our vision is of a Los Angeles regional economy that is growing, equitable, sustainable, and resilient, and provides a healthy and high standard of living for all. Uh, lofty goal and it takes a lot of work, but um, this group is, is getting it done. The LAEDC has long been Southern California's leader, uh, most trusted thought leader on the regional economy and the convener of stakeholders uh, committed to envisioning and implementing inclusive economic growth strategies for our region. 
Today, our Los Angeles regional economy is still recovering from the devastating effects of COVID and the global pandemic and the associated impacts on global supply chains. The LAEDC continues to publish timely research to help inform state and local policies to facilitate recovery. And we are providing critical assistance to thousands of small businesses not yet out of the woods. Data always guides the LAEDC strategies. And today is a special day because we have a lot of data for you. Uh, lots of important data that's gonna help guide businesses, government institutions, workforce development strategies, uh, you name it throughout our economy. In addition to being board chair of the LAEDC, and I should plug also the World Trade Center, I hope to see you all at our Select LA coming up um, later this year. Uh, I am also proud to represent my law firm, O'Melveny. We are the oldest <coughs> law firm in Los Angeles. We were founded in 1885 when our, our city uh, was merely a dusty cattle town. But we've come a long way uh, since then, as has our city. Um, and we were really proud to share uh, the LAEDC's commitment to equality and sustainability. Um, and although we have come a long way uh, as a law firm and as a city, I truly believe the best is yet to come. Now I'd like to ask um, all of our uh, board of governors and executive committee members that are in the room to please stand and be acknowledged. Don't be shy. Please stand. All There we go. We've got a few there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, without your support and without your efforts, the LADC could not achieve all that we do for our economy and for our community. So we are very, very appreciative. Thank you for your support. The economic forecast event could not be possible without the support of our uh, presenting sponsor, Amazon. Uh, and I'd like to welcome a champion of our regional economy, Amazon's Director of Economic Development of the U.S. West Region, Ron Frierson. And it's Frierson, by the way. The reason I had to make the correction is my dad is in the crowd. And so he's visiting from Michigan and... Uh, had to let them know that we didn't change the name of Frierson once I came out to California, okay? Thank you, Steve, and um, thank you for the support and the leadership you've shown the LAEDC over um, so many years and also um, on so many levels. Good morning, friends. On behalf of my colleagues at Amazon, we're happy to be the presenting sponsor for this event, um, and I'm delighted that you've decided to share your morning with us. I'm a proud member of the LAEDC uh, organization I became familiar with while serving in my previous role as Director of Economic Policy for Mayor Garcetti. And I have a couple of my former colleagues here, former Deputy Mayor Kevin Keller, great leader, great leader, great person, happy that you're here. And we benefited greatly from the data-driven economic insights provided by the LAEDC. And to expand on Steve's opening remarks, the Los Angeles Economic Development Corporation um, champions equitable economic growth across the Los Angeles region. This economic forecast we're at today gives us a foundation to understand the current economic landscape so that we can work collectively as leaders in business, government, and academia to serve our broader community. Today is also designed for us to hear directly from industry experts on what they expect for the future of our city. Amazon supports the steadfast work of the LAEDC and the timely re research they provide that helps guide economic development in this region. I applaud the LAED's leadership and its ability to lead collaboratively and its, um, its role as a regional convener. So with that, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome the new president and CEO of the LAEDC, Mr. Stephen Chun. I love the 70s music that's been played when I come back here. Um, 
and since I, I last saw you, I've actually gotten a lot grayer and I apologize because my eyesight's also decreased. So I'm going to have to read a bit more closely. But good morning, ladies and gentlemen. W welcome. Um, and thank you, Steve, and thank you, Ron, for, for your opening remarks and your welcome introduction. Today's economic forecast is part of our longstanding approach of leading with research and data, and it could not happen without our generous sponsors. So please help me to thank each of our partners who helped us to bring this event to you today. Our presenting sponsor, Amazon. Once again, thank you, Ron. And thank you to the entire Amazon team as well for your continued support. Our gold sponsor, Nixon Peabody, and its outstanding managing partner, Justin Thompson, who also sits on our executive committee and is a moderator uh, for our panel on commercial real estate today. Thank you. Wells Fargo, um, specifically the leadership of Greg Shirkin, Angela Yim Sullivan, and Justine Gonzalez, who is also moderating our panel on small business recovery. Thank you. Our silver sponsors, the California Wellness Foundation, California Community Foundation, Los Angeles Regional Consortium of Community Colleges, and U.S. Bank. We also want to thank our bronze sponsor for their generous support. Please join me in acknowledging the commitment of all these fine institutions whose name you see on our screen this morning. Now, the LAEDC's annual economic forecast is Southern California's premier source for in-depth economic information and insight into the future. This morning, we have an excellent program for you with our fantastic keynote speaker, Dr. Derek Hamilton, founding director of the Institute on Race, Power, and Political Economy at the New School. And LABC's own Shannon Sedgwick from the Institute for Applied Economics with a forecast on the regional and local outlook. You will then get an opportunity to attend one of three breakout sessions, transition of key industries, small business recovery, or commercial real estate. Each of the, these three breakouts has an impressive group of presenters who are leaders in each subject area. And to close out our morning, we'll have former Mayor Antonio Villaragosa, who will sit down with me to discuss the state's infrastructure projects. I also want to take this opportunity to guide you through uh, LADC's approach to economic development. <laughs> so many of you have been coming over here listening to um, our economic data and economic forecasts. And every single year, during the LADC's economic forecast, we learn about data and trends that are shaping our regional economy. From the reports that you have access later on today to the presentation and panels that we just mentioned, we'll hear from industry leaders and experts about opportunities and challenges that our region will face in coming years. And for LADC, the economic forecast report also helped guide and shape our programs. We take the insight that we have learned and we tweak it and we change our programs to effectively impact our community. However, economic forecast is not the only tool that we utilize to guide program development. If we only focus on the numbers and data, it could be very easy for us to forget about the reason why we have our programs, the people of Los Angeles and the businesses of Los Angeles and the communities of Los Angeles. So one important tool is our personal lived experience. May I please have uh, the LADC staff member, please stand up for a second and raise your hand. Don't be shy, come on. Oops. These are the folks who day in and day out dedicated their careers to economic development. And each of their personal stories and their personal experience reflect the stories of many Angelinos across this region. For me, I'm an immigrant from Hong Kong. Integration into this community was challenging and difficult. You see, when I first arrived, I didn't speak any English. I still remember, I thought thank you was one word. So I go around for, for probably months, if not a year, saying thank you, you to a lot of folks until someone corrected me. And like many Angelinos, our family struggled financially. My monolingual mother, uh, who was a single mother of three, um, worked in a sweatshop in El Monte. For every shirt she made, she made five cents. And I would cut the strings off of each of the shirts that she made, uh, she made, and I would make half a penny for each of those shirts. Very, at a very young age, I saw the impact in terms of people and communities who do not have access to resources and access to opportunities. And education became my way out. So I was ecstatic when I was admitted to UCLA. However, I also learned that getting access doesn't mean that you understand the pathway to career uh, and to good jobs or to just a pathway of, of, of a future opportunity. And as a first generation college student, I entered a pathway that I have no clue what I was going to do. Four years into my education and right before I was about to graduate, I had a crisis at hand, literally. 
You see, I ended up as a psychobiology major and I was doing opiate receptor research. And I had two dead right rats in my hand that I was about to decapitate because I need to study his brain. At that moment, I realized this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'm an animal lover. And by the way, I stopped eating meat for about a year because of that incident. But the good thing is finally I, find my, I found my calling when I learned of an organization here in Los Angeles called the Asian Pacific American Legal Center. Um, I, this, this nonprofit organization was working on the case to help Thai immigrants, a group of Thai immigrants who were trapped in a sweatshop in El Monte. And they freed them and they helped them get access to job opportunities, housing opportunities, and the future. And then I was completely hooked into, into the public service. And so since then, I've been dedicating my life to public service as well. And I had this great opportunity to work in nine years with the city of Los Angeles. And when I was working for Mayor uh, Antonio Villagosa and Mayor Garcetti, I learned of the importance and the power of public policy and what that could mean to support the growth of businesses and industries that can then provide additional opportunities for those who are most disinvested and the communities that have not been able to give them access. And that led me to WTCLA, the World Trade Center Los Angeles and the LADC, where collectively with the amazing lived experiences of my other colleagues and guided by an amazing uh, and dedicated board, we have created our five pillar approach to economic development. And in order to move and shape our economy, the LADC will unite the power of our various programs to support and build ecosystems and transform ecosystems. We're focused on five major pillars, research, industry cluster development, business assistance, international trade, and workforce development. Combined together, we hope to be able to bring together the, those power to move one industry and one ecosystem at a time. Let me explain a little bit more. Imagine the power of the research that we're able to do to identify the growing sectors and the, the sectors with the most potential for this entire region. Once we have that understanding of what sectors we should invest in, then we bring together industry councils made up of public, private, academic, philanthropic, labor, environment, nonprofit, industry, all stakeholder groups coming together to help us lay, help us lay out a blueprint. Understanding where we are now in 2023, where do we wanna go as a region in three, five, and 10 years? And with that approach, we're, this blueprint will really drive the economic development uh, strategies and programs. And it will also shape our next three pillar, business assistance. This, th uh, this blueprint, or these blueprints actually, will basically help us think about how do we help our local small and medium-sized companies, especially those in BIPOC community and women-owned enterprises that's been left out of the recovery efforts. How do we make sure that they're part of the supply chain that sustains the development of those particular industries? The blueprint will also help us guide our international strategy. Rather than waiting around, Los Angeles is uh, home to the world's third largest consular corps with over 100 countries represented here. Why are we just waiting for them to tell us what they want to do here? We should be proactively going out based on the research, based on the industry council's uh, guidance to go after top companies around the world to bring them to Los Angeles so they can contribute to our local economy. And finally, the blueprint will also help shape our talent development system and the workforce development system. In partnership with the Los Angeles Community College, the, the Los Angeles Regional Consortium, uh, this Yes, thank you for being here. The, the CSUs, uh, the universities, uh, the talent development systems throughout, whether it's workforce development boards or AGCCs, combined together, we can really start recruiting, identifying the next generation, but not only the next generation workers of workers, but also those that have been displaced because of COVID. Combined together, we can make sure that they're aligned with career paths, with industries that will hire them. So they will also have a pathway and they would know what that pathway is gonna look like to guarantee that they can have a career path and job opportunities of the future. So these five pillars combined together, we can move one ecosystem at a time. Can you imagine if we're able to shape the future of the aerospace and defense economy here, the blue or ocean economy, the digital media entertainment economy, the green economy, infrastructure, housing, all these great, industries that can basically combine together to move our ecosystems and be able to provide a lot of great opportunities for the region. That's the power of what this can do for us. So I'm delighted and I'm honored to announce that today we're going to be launching our first of our major industry cluster, which is going to be focused on bioscience. Over the last few months, we've been discussing and partnering with our friends over at Biocom California, uh, Bioscience LA, and Larda Institute. And we're 
going to be launching a new initiative called Grow LA Bio. Over the coming weeks and months, you'll be hearing about a number of different events that we'll be inviting you to join so that we can really collectively start shaping this economy. And with that, as I was mentioning before, we'll bring together our partners at the Los Angeles Regional Consortium, uh, our friends at BizFed, our friends at uh, the Department of Economic Opportunities in the county, getting all these supports, but we cannot do it alone. We need all of you to come together so we can build this economic strategy, this blueprint for this entire region. And once we're able to launch the first bioscience one, I encourage you to all join us as we're launching the next industry clusters. As I was saying before, no one group or individual can solve the problem that we face today. And in order for us to build a reimagined regional economy that's equitable, growing, sustainable, and resilient, one that provides a high and healthy of standard of living for all Angelinos. We need your help and we need your support. We thank you for being here today to listen to the amazing program that we have for you, but we're also very excited that we'll be partnering with all of you over the coming years to make sure that we're able to transform Los Angeles into a sustainable and growing and resilient and equitable economy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And now that we're here, I want to bring back uh, to the stage Danaji and uh, show it, lead us to our next presentation. So thank you so much. Wow, that's quite the way to start a morning, right? Please, another round of applause, for Mr. Steven Chung. Amazing story, amazing plan. Looking forward to everything you guys are going to do for our economy here in LA. The LA EDC Institute of Applied Economics works year round, gathering and analyzing data and providing informative and influential research and analysis in our regional economy. I am beyond delighted to introduce you to the director of the LA EDC's Institute of Applied Economics, Mrs. Shannon Sedwick. Where is Shannon? <laughs> She will be providing highlights from our 2023 economy forecast report. And again, the full report is available right in the middle of your tables. You'll see our QR code. All the information is there so you can follow, please. Please welcome again Ms. to Ms. Uh, Shannon Sedwick to the stage. Thank you for coming today. Thank you, Donna G, and uh, thank you to all of you for joining us this morning as we share our economic outlook through 2024. Uh, the Institute for Applied Economics, the LADC, is a very small team uh, dedicated to providing objective and unparalleled economic and policy expertise to decision makers with critical information um, from which to make informed decisions. Uh, it's in this way that the Institute supports LADC in achieving its mission of reinventing our economy to collaboratively advance growth and prosperity for all. Uh, before I begin my presentation, I'd like to take just a moment to recognize our senior economist, uh, Dr. Justin L. Adams. Justin, can you stand up and wave? Hello, out there. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and our, our, research, uh, our research analyst, Max Dunsker, um, who both worked tirelessly beside me producing this forecast that we're presenting to you today. Um, the 2023 LADC economic forecast uh, with a the theme of which is moving beyond the recovery. As this year opened, we find ourselves further removed from the dramatic economic decline in 2020 brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. But now we're facing uncertainty with inflation. Um, recall that the economy in 2021 was on a general path of recovery with GDP and employment recouping a significant amount of their 2020 losses. Um, at the time, we voiced concern over rising price levels, uh, especially given the generous uh, fiscal stimulus, which increased household incomes and consumption. Uh, then 2022 was a year of tremendous transition um, as our economy progressed in its recovery from an adaption to the COVID-19 disruption and global supply chain issues were further complicated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, last year, the Federal Reserve spent much of its time combating inflation uh, with a series of large rate hikes intended to slow the economy and reduce upward pressure on prices. 
Today, three years beyond the start of the pandemic, much of the recovery from the pandemic-induced economic dislocations has run its course. However, uh, the pandemic, COVID-19, has dramatically altered the lives of many and significantly impacted regional, state, and global economies. Uh, economic concerns have shifted to the potential impacts of national monetary policy, continuing global supply chain disruptions, and long-term economic restructuring moving forward. Non-farm employment shows we fully recovered. Uh, total non-farm employment has returned to its pre-pandemic levels in the US, in California, and Los Angeles County. However, beneath the surface, recovery has been uneven across industries. Federal policymakers are dealing with persistent high inflation. U.S. consumer spending has been supporting GDP growth despite the dual headwinds of rising interest rates and high inflation. U.S. households are working through extra savings related to stimulus payments and other pandemic-related assistance programs. And this excess in household savings has been playing a part in propping up consumer spending. Uh, another challenge the Fed's been, made, been facing is that uh, a continued strong labor market. So one factor that uh, is working in the Federal Reserve's favor with respect to getting inflation under control is the easing of supply chain bottlenecks. The Federal Reserve uh, raised the U.S. federal fund rates rapidly last year, um, seven times in 2022 and then once in 2023 to where it stands now, um, spurring higher interest rates for credit cards, auto loans, and, and mortgages in the process. Uh, if the strength in the labor market persists, the Federal Reserve may feel the need to implement additional rate hikes um, and other actions in 2023 to try to tamp down the economy to temper inflation. So will there be a recession? That's the question on everyone's minds lately. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York uses a three month, 10 year yield curve to calculate the probability of a recession in the next 12 months. Um, and the most recent readings show this probability starting to spike uh, in mid 2023. So current spreads indicate that there is now a 47% chance of a recession by the end of this year. Uh, in other words, that means the nation is nearly at the point where having a recession is equally likely as not having one. As with the nation, the state of California uh, is moving into a new economic paradigm. State policymakers are shifting their focus uh, from overcoming the economic impacts of the pandemic to instead addressing the effects of national monetary policy and global supply chain instability on the state. Although national monetary policy and global supply chains cannot be influenced at the state level, uh, California's government can focus on planning for the impact of these as well as on other pressing economic issues, such as fostering equitable economic development and addressing housing needs of communities. With the losses of 2020 recouped in 2021, 2022 was a year of slow growth with more such years forecasted to follow. We expect a small bump in real GDP um, in 2024 after a year of slower flat growth this year. We mostly expect inflation to remain elevated through 2024 and incomes to lose ground. Uh, while inflation measured 8% at the national level for 2022, um, the December release showed an annualized rate, uh, annualized rise of only 6.5%. So this follows monthly declines in the second half of the year. So there's some optimism that inflation could be returning to more manageable levels. We expect unemployment to inch higher as the economy cools this year. Uh, should a policy over correction occur, a recession, depending on its severity, could result in prolonged economic disaster dislocations and job losses that impact households and business as much, if not more than inflation has. In Los Angeles County and the rest of California, we expect educational and health services to dominate employment growth moving forward through 2024. Um, in 2023, 
Job growth is expected to slow with a forecasted non-farm job growth rate of 0.8% in California. Uh, and construction, natural resources and mining, manufacturing, trade, transportation, utilities, and financial activities, those sectors are all expected to see contraction in payroll employment this year, uh, with most of those experiencing a further contractions um, in the following year, 2024. Through the, through the recovery, though the recovery of total employment is complete, um, the changes spurred by the COVID-19 pandemic will continue to affect our economy in this new paradigm. Um, so they include shifts in industrial employment distribution, um, there's changing face of commercial real estate, continued vulnerability of small business, um, a labor force exodus for those with less educational attainment, um, population declines at the state, county and city level, uh, and unemployment has, this is, this is the positive point, uh, unemployment has become more equally distributed across race and ethnicity in California over the last three years. So below the surface of recovery in the county, there are clear winners and losers um, that are emerging. So knowledge-based industries such as education and health services, professional business services, they continue to lead job growth while tourism-based industries such as accommodation and arts, entertainment and recreation have posted additional job losses um, beyond what their pre-pandemic baseline was. Uh, so not a full recovery there. As, December, um, as of December, 2022, Food services and drinking establishments reported 19,700 fewer jobs than in February of 2020. And that was the last month before restrictive health orders uh, were established to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Additionally, both poverty and income inequality uh, in Los Angeles County and the rest of the state increased since the onset of COVID-19. Uh, and that's reversing some of the gains that had been made leading up to the start of the pandemic. Commercial real estate in Los Angeles is grappling with fewer companies and fewer workers. Uh, the drop in primary daytime occupancy was starkest amongst areas once filled with workers, such as central business districts. These changes have implications for real estate demand, prices, and future supply. Uh, location and class type, they're influencing vacancy rates. Inflation and the threat of a recession in 2023 are creating headwinds uh, that will threaten further economic gains for small business. In the first year after the president's emergency declaration on the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, small businesses recovered unevenly, both by size and industry. Today, an increasing number of small businesses expect uh, sales and business conditions to deteriorate. The Small Business Optimum Index, it's not fallen to these levels in roughly uh, the past 10 years. So it now currently sits below the levels that we witnessed in this index during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so you don't think that we're all doom and gloom this year. Um, we're happy to share that over the last three years, unemployment has become uh, more equally distributed across demographic groups in California. Unemployment rates ranged from 9.5 to 23.6% across the different demographic groups in December of 2020. Uh, that's a 14.1 percentage point spread. In December of 2022, rates are ranging from 4% to 4.7%, and that's only a 0.7 percentage spread. And since we always like to end on a positive note, uh, this year we end our presentation highlighting planned federal uh, and state investment. Optimism surrounds the, the uh, impact that these sizable investments from federal and state governments uh, will make in California and in Los Angeles County to transform our regional economy. California will receive infrastructure investments from the bipartisan infrastructure deal through formula funding and competitive grants. It's estimated that over five years, the fiscal year 2022 to 2026, California will receive 41.9 billion in formula funding alone. And it's estimated that the 3.25 billion already spent in bipartisan infrastructure deal funds in California has generated over 42,000 jobs to date. 
So across all American Rescue Plan programs, California was awarded nearly 195 million. In addition to federal investment that we have just identified, the state has a series of large scale investment programs, funding projects statewide, including the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017, better known as SB1 on the street, um, and the Community Economic Resilience or SURF uh, program. So federal and state investment made into the Los Angeles region and the rest of California. It'll enable us to be more resilient in these uncertain times with funded projects helping to mitigate the negative effects of a potential recession, um, to promote growth in key industries, and to gain additional ground towards a more equitable and sustainable economy at the county and state level. So this concludes our forecast presentation. Uh, thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to join us today. Uh, if you're interested in taking a closer look at our full forecast in addition to the code on your table, it will be available on our website at www.ladc.org. Thank you. We definitely want to thank Shannon. Thank you so much for all of that valuable information that we're going to be able to use to make sure that we are prepared and help our communities in the future. The Institute of Applied Economics team, also thank you so much to Dr. Justin Adams and Max Duster, Dux, Dunsker, Dunsker, I apologize. Max, thank you so much for all your support. We are looking forward to um, share all this information. Again, you'll find the QR code on the tables in case you didn't catch anything or you wanna share with your colleagues in the future. And now I would like to welcome our keynote speaker for this morning forecast. He is Dr. Hamilton. Dr. Hamilton is a university professor, Henry Cohen Professor of Econ Economics and Urban Policy and founding director of the Institute on Race, Power and Political Economy at the New School. Consider one of the nation's foremost public intellectuals. Professor Hamilton has been profiled in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and that's just to name a few. He was named a Freedom Scholar by the Margareti Casey Foundation and the group Health Foundation. Professor Hamilton has been involved in crafting policy proposals that have um, garner media attention and inspire legislative proposals at the federal, state, and local level. So we are very excited to have him here today, including baby bonds, guaranteed income, and uh, also federal job guarantees. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. Dr. Hamilton's full bio, you'll be able to find it again in the QR code on your tables. Please scan them. Don't forget to follow the information. So I want to welcome, please, big round of applause to our keynote speaker. He is Dr. Hamilton. Please welcome to the stage. Thank you. I like the theme music. <laughs> it is an absolute honor and pleasure to be here in this magnificent room uh, to deliver a talk about a human rights economy, consistent with the theme that Stephen Olson laid out in the beginning of reinventing our economy. I'm gonna talk a lot about our capacity to choose our capacity to define the economy we want. I'm gonna also make the point that politics, economics, and the ways in which we divide people in cursory social identities like race, gender, sexual orientation, they have never been separable. We make a mistake when we think about binaries of economics and politics or race and economics or politics and gender, and not thinking of all three in an iterative way. So let me begin. And, and again, I should have led with gratitude. Gratitude to everyone, uh, gratitude to this group, uh, gratitude to uh, people in this room that uh, probably have day jobs that could occupy them 
and doing other things, but they're committed to a social good. They're, they're committed to something, structures well beyond themselves that can facilitate not only themselves, but everyone else. And I wanna give some shout outs to Los Angeles also in leading, leading in this redefinition of what society can and should, should be doing. And I'll just name two points uh, that stand out. In this pandemic, with the American Rescue Plan, Los Angeles has been leading in fulfilling the values of ARPA research. They measure what they desire because they know that we, we value what we measure and we measure what we value. So in decisions as it relates to distribution of these resources, equity has become a theme within how they choose. Um, something else, one of the biggest guaranteed income demonstrations in the country is taking place right here in Los Angeles. 1,000 people are receiving $1,000 a month for the next three years. And you know what this is doing? Combating narratives. In the past, 10 years ago, could we have imagined giving poor people money? People would say, well, why are we going to do that? To which the answer should be because they don't have enough money. But... <laughs> But we're also seeing that this notion that facilitating people with resources did not actually lead to things like displacement of work. In fact, it facilitates work. So we're challenging narratives. We're challenging our conventional ways of thinking. And again, I dare say and applaud you all because Los Angeles is leading. You know what we don't start with when we ask, when we think about economics? What is the purpose of an economy? You know, I teach economics a lot and scarcely have I seen uh, other faculty or other classes lead with that question. And again, that goes into what we can define. So I can say from a personal standpoint, I'm not motivated to produce knowledge solely for my love of knowledge, but rather I have the objective as an economist to produce knowledge to the extent to build economic inclusion, civic engagement, and social equity. To do what the Nobel laureate Amarta Sen has described as a human capabilities economy where we enable people to define and attain their self-determined goals. We should recognize that all scholarship is rooted in norms. We begin with what type of values we wanna have and what type of society we wanna have especially economic scholarship that proclaims to study production, transaction, and distribution. And I know in this talk, I'm gonna ruffle some feathers in this room, so let me, let me say that to begin with. We should recognize that we all begin with rigor, even when you wanna discuss, when you wanna investigate institutions and behaviors and how they intertwine in building a human rights economy. The framing of my discipline economics as a science in and of itself, it presents an innuendo of a purity devoid of politics, power, and tribalism. These are three things we've seen constantly throughout time and across societies. The emergent orthodox economics, I'm going to argue it's a dogma. Ironically, it's a dogma. And it's a bipartisan faith across Democrats and Republicans that markets are somehow natural, transparent, efficient, and inevitable. The belief does not give enough credence to the politics and the political actions that form and codify markets in the, in the first place. The concept of individual price takers as a baseline, it doesn't adequately account for power and capital especially when we think about group-based identity group disparities across race and gender. So some things and topical things to consider as we're moving forward, because they're def definitely going to be coming up in our society. Uh, taxes. Well beyond revenue collection, the, there's a role of taxation in strategically distributing resources. A tax cut is industrial policy, whether we admit it or not. The difference between a tax subsidy and a tax cut, a, a tax rebate or a tax cut, uh, on a ledger line, they're essentially the same things. We need to consider how economic inequality 
erodes democracy. We need to consider measures of economic value beyond our conventional measures like growth, which might be a valuable measure, but in and of itself, it does not capture the dimensions of morality, civic engagement, distribution. We should consider the role of money and monetary policy in facilitating economic inclusion. We should consider economic vulnerability to environmental risk, pandemic, and natural disaster. And then especially we need to think about the role of technology as it relates to economic empowerment versus economic exploitation. Let me say a little bit about inflation. By no means do I wanna be callous towards the real harm that many families are experiencing to make their ends meet with rising prices. But my concern is a public anxiety around price instability that's being manipulated or gaslit to dwarf fiscal policies towards promoting stable employment, higher wages, and better working, con working conditions. In terms of wages and inflation, inflation, shouldn't we be willing to live with some level of inflation if it's predicated on workers receiving a real wage increase in a distributional inclusive way? The point is that inflation in and of itself need not be a bad thing, despite some of the non-nuanced anxiety around it. We want stable trends and prices, but we also want real wages rising at a faster rate than inflation. We should care and focus on who is gaining purchasing power under an economic regime governing our economy where in the last 50 years, there has scarcely been an increase in purchasing power, especially for workers when we look at the productivity rises that they have experienced. In contrast, gains have gone to the wealthy and upper middle class, all while there's a delicate two-step fiscal policy going on of tax cuts, bank bailouts, deregulation, while the Fed comes in on the back end and maintains price stability. Expansionary policy with a keen eye towards distributional inclusion, environmental security, it's necessary to promote a healthy and just economy, especially in the context of what we just experienced in a global pandemic. We know that many Americans, black and brown and indigenous, indigenous families in particular, they have low wealth, low income, inadequate health care, are unemployed or underemployed. And when they do work, they work in precarious but essential jobs that have fewer workplace protections, lower wages and lower benefits. It's naive to not recognize that essentially every policy and structure in Los Angeles and the U.S. in general is racialized. And the impact of that racialization is by no means limited to black, Latinx and indigenous people. Ignorance of a past and existing racial hierarchy under the guise of forward looking race neutrality is basically what the sociologist Eduardo Bonilla Silver accurately describes as colorblind racism. Racism, sexism and other isms, they're not simply irrational prejudices but long leveraged strategic mechanisms that have been used for exploitation and extrapolation that have benefited some at the expenses of others. That is immoral. But as inequality continues to grow, the charge is to move beyond a framing that exclusively centers a free market, personal responsibility and individual choice devoid of an adequate understanding of resource power and distribution towards a new thinking, a more moral and fair political economy grounded in human rights and promoting our shared prosperity. We're advancing the concept of inclusive economic rights, the promotion of human rights economies, where economic rights are emphasized as a cornerstone to our nation's future and our state and locality futures as well. This is not new, nor is it radical. In the wake of World War II and the dismantling of a context of a fascist Nazi regime, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights issued five pillars of rights, civil rights, political rights, social rights, cultural rights, and we forget the fifth one, economic rights. 
For me, that framework of economic rights, it is politically mobilizing. I see it as a baseline for participation and engagement. Civil rights, the right to vote, the right to choose, they're irrelevant if you're hungry, if you're unsheltered, if you have no income. A human rights economy recognizes that race, gender, nativity, sexual orientation, and identity in general should have no transactional value. It calls for the elimination of identity. It does not call for the elimination of identity. There is aesthetic, cultural, and prideful attachment to one's identity. What it calls for is the end of material and hierarchical positioning attached to a social identity. A 21st century iteration of that framework put forth by the United Nations and FDR would learn from the failures of the past and recognize that we need to implement economic rights in an anti-racist, anti-sexist way. What that means is it needs to be intentionally inclusive in the way we design, manage, and implement policies. Let's give some statistics. An Economic Policy Institute report entitled The Productivity Pay Gap traces the relationship between economic growth and worker compensation since the middle of the 21st, 20th century. And they find from the period between 1948 and 1979, a post-war period characterized by dramatic economic growth, productivity more than doubled, while at the same time, worker compensation rose by 93.2%. That's almost a one-to-one -one relationship between growth and productivity. In contrast, if we look at the period between 1979 and up to now, a period that I'm going to label a neoliberal period, a period that emphasized a trickle-down supply-side economics, productivity rose by 70%, while real worker compensation rose by merely 12%. So during the New Deal and Great Society period, we had high economic growth, middle-class lifestyles became more accessible, and with a doubling of American productivity, clearly firms benefited as well. What is critical to note is that an American middle class never simply emerged. Rather, it was government policy that provided the finance, education, land, and infrastructure to accumulate and pass down wealth. That GI Bill and several New Deal post-war policies, they were successful examples of government intervention where we invested in the heavily, heavily in the highest growth of an American middle class. But we didn't do it perfectly. That Faustian bargain to maintain a racial hierarchy and convince legislators to come on board, it was not an accident that by design, implementation, and management, Black people were largely excluded from those wealth-generating attributes of that period. Hence, we have this dramatic racial wealth gap today. So I'm concerned with time, so I'm going to move a little, a little faster and, and ahead. So in this current system that we have, we use words like freedom and choice. They're weaponized. They're weaponized as rhetorical devices intended to appeal to one's desire and agency not to be a victim. It feeds into the proverbial American narrative that through hard work, through effort, individuals can turn their proverbial rags into riches. What we do in this narrative is we offer individual anecdotes as evidence of the power of effort and ingenuity. But what is not offered in this paradigm is the systematic evidence of the countless numbers of hardworking individuals who do not attain social mobility. And likewise, the anecdotes of individuals who are born into privilege, who remain into that, in that privilege regardless of any effort extended. Existing distributions today are products of often racialized, exploitive, and extractive histories. As such, a rebalance of power and public intervention is necessary. The rhetorical elegance of freedom and choice and a specific notion of rights, not the economic rights of people, but the economic rights of property is devoid of an honest reckoning of the immoral practices by which property may have become distributed in the first place. 
Without resources, individuals are largely restricted from benefiting from economic markets. And instead, they're at the whim of the charitable inklings of people with power in that market, or they're vulnerable to exploitation of other agents in that market who do have power. We frame the racial wealth gap, including the use of alternative financial products. In that framing, we focus on poor financial choices and decision-making on the part of largely Black, Latinx, and poor borrowers. The problem is the framing is wrong. It's more likely that meager economic circumstance, not poor decision-making or deficient knowledge, that meager economic circumstance constrains choice itself and leaves poor borrowers with little to no other financial options but to attain and use predatory or abusive financial products. Households with few assets and low incomes, they're compelled to turn to high cost, unconventional alternative financial products. They're generally aware that these products are bad, but they have no alternatives. These last resort debt traps render the recipients of them indentured borrowers having to pay higher and higher interest rates and fees ultimately until they default on the original principle of the, of that of that uh, cap of that uh, of that loan so i'm running out of time so i'm going to try to close out and in perhaps in the q and a we can talk about specific policies the framing of our economy currently naturalizes poverty and inequality by castigating it as the result of unproductive and deficient behavior. That is, subpar outcomes are seen as resulting from personal choices of individuals and communities. An inclusive economic rights frame turns all this on its head by locating poverty and inequality as resulting from an absence of resources. That is, poverty and inequality are the result of policy choices. Policy choices that deny people the resources they need to live meaningful lives. The frame calls for government to end poverty directly by placing resources in the hands of people as a right. And clearly, I'm talking about adding to the productive elements of our economy, not just economic security, which is important in and of its own, own self. In essence, without resources, individuals are largely restricted from benefiting from economic markets. There's a baseline set of enabling goods and services that are so critical for individual self-determination without which we have vulnerability. That's why we need public intervention to counterbalance economic and racialized private power in which in isolation, we know markets are incapable to redress. We need governments to intervene when we have inferior private options, private options that don't ensure universal and quality healthcare, housing, schooling, financial services, capital, and the free mobility throughout society without the psychological and physical threat of detention at the hands of a state-sanctioned violence because your identity is linked to a vulnerable or stigmatized group. We should be looking to initiate the economic right to a productive and quality job, for instance. We should, let me close, I'm about to close, sorry. We need to get measurement right. Growth has become an explicit measure of economic well being. In isolation, it fails to adequately capture the multiple dimensions of prosperity, like human capabilities, morality, sustainability, and civic engagement. We need measures of economic well being and economic policy that center people and the environments in which we live. We need industrial policy that centers people in the places that they live. Government has a fiduciary to invest in our most treasured resource, and that is people. We need to learn from the failures of the past with this policy, this people-centric physical and human infrastructure package, and we need to make them permanent and design them and implement them in an anti-racist, anti-sexist way. This approach 
would dismantle the material consequences and social stigma associated with race, gender, and if one's immigrant status without this potent policy apparatus to provide economic pathways and self-determination for all people, that ugly word white supremacy and the despotic political appeal for divisive or fascist leadership, it will not go away, it will always remain. So in closing, here's my call to arms to all of you. Commit to justice, commit as a matter of faith, Commit simply because it is the right thing to do. For all of us, in the end, it is our economy. We do get to choose. It is our monetary and tax system by which we can facilitate the economy we want. And finally, it is our government, the mechanism to design and achieve the economy and world that we desire. Thank you. Dr. Hamilton, we need just a full day of your incredible knowledge. Just a full day. Thank you so much for those outstanding facts. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. Now I would like to welcome Shannon and of course, Dr. Hamilton for a quick Q&A. We have two very important questions. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Are we having a good time? Yes, I like it. Okay, are we ready to share all this amazing information with colleagues when we're done? I love it. Shannon, thank you so much for being here today. I'm so excited to talk to you. I, we have a quick question. In Los Angeles, 94% of businesses employed 20 or fewer people. How do we see small businesses uh, faring in this new normal? Well, you are correct. There are 93, roughly, it's been tracking 93, 94% of businesses um, in Los Angeles County that do have uh, one to four employees. And so it's it's been challenging for them throughout the pandemic. They were disproportionately impacted. As I indicated a little bit earlier, um, you know, many of these small businesses were in industries that still haven't fully recovered. And so they have still been continuing to feel the pain. And then now they're facing these, these headwinds that are related to inflation and the uncertainty that goes along with trying to predict um, if there's going to be a recession or not and what that means for them in terms of, of their inventories and labor costs and, and potentially decreased consumption and demand. So um, they, they definitely um, are going to face challenges moving forward. And I think that's why it's so important for us as a, a county in a region and in economic development to find ways to support them, whether that's creating programs, providing outreach, um, or just informing them with as much data and information as we can. Thank you so much. Dr. Hamilton, I know that there was something that you really wanted to talk about. So we chose a, a question that was fitted for that. Los Angeles is huge uh, geographically and it has almost 10 million people in this county. How do you think we can create actual policies and programs to address the needs of our diverse communities? Yeah, great question. And, and you know, the fiscal reality is that state and localities are different than the federal government. However, uh, California is in Los Angeles in particular are different than your typical state and locality. Um, but hopefully one of the things I tried to uh, emphasize in the talk is a lot of it is choice and policies and narratives. So at the very least, we need to start redefining and understanding inequality um, but that said, I think policies that are directly taking on the problem head on are useful. For example, wealth. Uh, the state of California now is considering versions of baby bonds. So in the children that are orphaned as a result of the pandemic, uh, the state is considering setting aside a set amount of resources so that when they become young adults, they have some seed capital so that they can accumulate wealth. I mean, one thing we know for sure is that the most critical ingredient to generate wealth is capital itself. Financial information, coaching, and literacy, they're all important and relevant and useful, 
but they become irrelevant without the finances to manage themselves and potentially cruel. So I, you know, I think in, in all these dimensions, there is no one silver bullet policy, but we need policies directed at enabling people with the necessary resources so that they can be contributing uh, members in a productive way to our society. Thank you so much for that. I love that. I really do. There are so many more questions that we have. Unfortunately, we do have limited time. So in case there's a question that you might have, please stop them in their tracks in this little break that we're going to take. We want to thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate all the knowledge that you shared with us today. We're going to take a quick 10 minute break. Don't forget to visit our exhibitors, please. Uh, don't forget that also at 945 prompt, we're going to uh, start our breakout sessions. So please enjoy a little coffee coffee, maybe a little appetizer, some donuts, something sweet, shake off this, um, the morning rut, right? Uh, in 10 minutes, we're going to go ahead and start uh, the breakout sessions. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. Appreciate it.
Hello, everyone. Please make your way to the breakout sessions. The breakout sessions will begin momentarily. So please make your way to your respective breakout sessions. They will start in just a few minutes. Thank you. Please make your way to the breakout sessions. They are going to begin in just one minute. So please make your way to the breakout sessions. Take a seat. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. If you are looking for the breakout session on the transition in key industries, it will be in this main ballroom. Commercial real estate and small business recovery will be right out those doors to your right. So we'll be starting shortly. Everyone, please take your seat. If you are in this ballroom for transition of key industries breakout session, please take your seats. Thank you.
Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the transition of Key Industries breakout session. My name is Melissa Cam, and I'm the Vice President of Strategic Relations for the LAEDC. Welcome again, everyone, for the breakout session, Transition of Key Industries. We are running a couple of minutes behind, but this breakout session will last until about 10.45 a.m. We will have approximately 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A at the end, so we do ask that you please hold your questions for that time. Uh, once this session is done, we'll have another uh, quick coffee break for you all. And then we ask everyone to come back to this main ballroom at 11 a.m. so that you can participate in the fireside chat with Mayor Villaraigosa and LAEDC President and CEO Stephen Chung. And now, at this time, I'd like to reintroduce Amazon's Director of Economic Development of the U.S. West Region, Mr. Ron Frierson. Uh, thank you, guys. I didn't know the microphone was hot. Um, it's good that I'm always prepared for that. Um, thank you again for spending your morning with us, and thank you for selecting to attend this um, breakout session. And we're discussing transition industries this morning. Um, I'm somewhat uniquely qualified to moderate this panel, not because of my role with Amazon. I am the Director of Economic Development for the Western United States for Amazon covering primarily the West Coast, multiple states, which gives me some sort of insight into a lot of various industries. Same um, takes place for my former role, which I was the Director of Economic Policy for Mayor Garcetti, which involves being able to go you know, deep into certain industries and understanding what their challenges and pain points are regarding the industry itself. Um, so we are very proud and lucky to have an esteemed panel that can speak across some of our legacy businesses. Um, we have Yarel. You got it right. I got it right. Yes. I told her I was saying my, her name in the, in the mirror this morning so much that it, maybe her face would pop up. Uh, <laughs> Yarel, Yarel Ramos with um, Univision. She's a news anchor with Univision, and she's going to be almost our, our subject matter expert on multiple fronts, primarily entertainment and also DEI when it comes into entertainment space as well. And we have Arnie Streeland. Arnie is a corporate lead executive with Northrop Grumman, which is a powerhouse in the aerospace industry. Um, and we also have Patrick, um, or I call him Pat, Pat Gabbitt. He's the Director of Manufacturing Sciences for Takeda. Very interesting story, Takeda, and I'm really excited to have him here. Takeda is one of a pharmaceutical uh, company, a global firm that you may or may not have heard of, but um, it's going to be really interesting to hear him speak. And we also have Kelly Mackey, who's the State Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Department of Industrial Relations for the state of California. And um, we also have Arwen, who when she's not a stunt um, double for action movies, uh, <laughs> she's also a litigating partner, a litigation partner uh, for employment and class action um, um, cases for Keenan Spalding. So let's give them all a round of applause. And so, um, as you can see, I have all these cue cards. So if I start to mishandle some or I drop one, I'm just pretend like you didn't see it because I'm gonna pretend as if I didn't see it as well, okay? So what I'm gonna do is go down the line to each of you and just ask you for one to kind of explain your role and what your company does and maybe give a little history as to um, your, your company, especially this is for Pat, to your, um, a little history on your company and why Los Angeles, okay? So let's start with Yadio. Thank you, Ron. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so nice to be here. Um, uh, once again, my name is Yadel Ramos and I anchor uh, a newscast on Televisa Univision here in Los Angeles. It's aired all across the state of California and as well as on our social and digital platforms. Uh, Univision is definitely a legacy and um, just an iconic place for information, entertainment, and access to the Latino community in Los Angeles and the greater LA, Southern California um, area. Um, I, can, I can go about telling you all the things and initiatives 
and uh, projects uh, to out to create outreach, civic engagement with our community, but more than anything, provide the Latino community in Los Angeles the resources, the information they need to thrive, um, to succeed, uh, to live in, in Los Angeles. Um, I grew up here in LA, so I, I feel like I'm part of uh, the history and the family. My parents, uh, immigrants from Mexico, also uh, found in uh, Univision a family and um, a place where they could really tune in and access everything that they missed from home, but also find ways to uh, make LA now their new home for themselves and for their children. Um, so for me, it's, it's, an, um, it's a privilege I feel every day and an honor to be part of this amazing organization. We went through a lot of changes um, through, uh, in the pandemic and obviously in this like digital area that we're living now, which we'll be talking about later. Um, but yes, uh, uh, we have uh, Unmision, our, the number one uh, newscast uh, across all demos, regardless of language. Um, I always find uh, that to be a lot of uh, a lot of a pride in, in the newsroom, where we also see a lot of changes uh, when it comes to digital uh, media and information. Fantastic. Thank you, Arnie. Yeah. Hi, Arnie Strayland, uh, as Ron said, corporate lead executive for Northrop Grumman. Uh, we are also a legacy or company here in this area. We were founded 84 years ago by Jack Northrop in Hawthorne, California. As an aircraft company, uh, we've evolved over the years to be an integrated aerospace company. We have a, a major presence in Los Angeles. We're the largest uh, aerospace and defense contractor in the Los Angeles area. Northrop Grumman has 32,000 uh, workers in the state of California. 18,000 of them are here in Los Angeles County, uh, primarily distributed between aircraft manufacturing. You've heard of the, the B-2 and the B-21 up in Palmdale. Uh, the F-18, all of you Tom Cruise uh, Top Gun Maverick fans out there, every one of those aircraft started their lives in El Segundo, California, at our plant and our uh, space park facility the largest uh, spacecraft manufacturing facility, I think, in the country, uh, where the Webb Space Telescope, that's what the, the pin is, or the mirror of that, uh, came from. So we are, uh, we have a long, uh, proud heritage here in LA, and what really makes uh, LA work for us is the workforce. We need a trained and educated workforce to, to build the things that, <clears throat> that the complex systems, you know, we say our, our mission is to uh, defend our nation and explore the universe. That takes a lot of people, that takes a lot of educated people. They don't all need to be Nobel Prize winning physicists, uh, but they need training beyond you know, primary education. So the importance of post-secondary education, community colleges, uh, the state university level, we have alumni from every CSU and every UC school uh, working for us in some capacity. Somehow we have apprenticeship programs with the local community colleges. Uh, all of that is vital to our long-term sustainment and growth. And, and it's uh, really critical for us, uh, as, especially as we see our aging workforce uh, transition out, as people start to retire, the baby boomer generation that came in for so much of the Cold War, for the Apollo program, for all that, as they retire, um, they need to be replaced with skilled, trained people for engineers, scientists, operators, technicians, all of those people. It, we, we need them to keep our business going. Business is good, business continue to grow, continues to grow, but we can't be successful without that workforce. So that's that's really why we're we're here. You know, we have a legacy, we have a, a huge legacy huge infrastructure here. We have a chip foundry that made the fastest chip in the world. You can look that up on the Guinness Book of World Records, but all those things need people to operate. And that's what keeps us here is, is the people, the educated workforce. Great, thank you, Ronnie. Well, good morning, everyone. And um, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you, Ron, for inviting me. Patrick Gavitt, and I work for a company called Takeda. So Takeda is a, a large pharmaceutical company based in Japan. Uh, but we have manufacturing sites all around the world. There's 31 different manufacturing sites that make uh, a variety of medicines for a variety of um, disease states. And the facility in Los Angeles, we're located pretty close to the LA Zoo. And we've been at this location for 70 years. This, this year would be our 70th anniversary at that location. 
The name of the company or the name on the front of the building has changed several times over the years through due to mergers and acquisitions. It started out as Highland Immuno and then later Baxter, uh, later Shire, and now Takeda. And what we do at our particular location is we purify proteins from human plasma. And these proteins are the active ingredients for the different medicines that we make. Um, in, in, in many of these medicines are life-saving, they, they're transformational to the patients who, who need these medicines. And because we, we use plasma as our starting material, we maintain a network of plasma collection centers around the country. We have over 200 of these centers where people come in to donate their plasma so that um, you know, they, they know that they're helping the patients who, who, who need our products. And um, we have a variety, I would say, say a whole gamut of different skill sets that we need. We're primarily a manufacturing site and many of our manufacturing uh, operators are, um, do not have a college degree. So they're, 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 high, they're high school graduates. And so it's really nice to be able to have high paying jobs for, for this workforce. Um, but we also need a, a good amount of technical expertise in, in the biochemistry arena, the engineering arena as well. So, um, so we do, um, partner with a lot of the local universities. We have good relationships with, some, with community colleges and the, the biotech programs that these community colleges offer. Great. Thank you, Ben. Hi, good morning, everyone. I have the privilege of leading a statewide effort on behalf of the administration to develop registered apprenticeship programs in non-traditional sectors. Many of you are probably familiar with our more traditional uh, registered apprenticeship programs in the trades, but what you may not be aware of is that over the last mostly decade or so, we've seen this increase in interest in a lot of different sectors that are really struggling to um, fill vital roles in order to provide services and um, meet customer demand. Um, the formation of the unit that I have the privilege of leading uh, was really the brainchild of our former governor and has since been really heralded and championed by uh, the Newsom administration to drive these opportunities in industries like information technology, healthcare, aerospace, um, pharmaceutical, business services, our public sector, among many others. And we have this valuable tool that we are introducing to a whole spectrum of uh, industry leaders and other stakeholders who are finding it to be incredibly valuable in order to secure their 21st century resilient, um, highly skilled workforce. And I'm honored to be here today to sit among um, industry folks, many of whom, a couple of whom actually we partner with on the formation of these registered apprenticeship programs. And I'm excited today to um, give you more information, maybe reintroduce you or perhaps introduce you to the first time to the really the gold standard for work-based learning, and that is registered apprenticeship. I'm also excited to talk about how Governor Newsom has really made historic investments to help our industry industries be successful. Um, we don't get to become the fourth uh, largest economy in the world without ensuring that our employers are thriving. And that also includes lifting up workers and providing viable career pathways. I am a native Angelino. I live in Northern California, but I have retained my love of this region, including my love of the Lakers, Dodgers, and Rams. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, I'm Arwin Johnson. I am a trial lawyer and the hiring partner at the Los Angeles office of King & Spalding, which is a global law firm that really um, has invested in California and Los Angeles in particular in the past uh, five years. I am not an LA native, but LA has my heart. I came to LA for law school, went to UCLA, and then clerked for two judges um, in Los Angeles, Dean Pragerson and Harry Pragerson, before starting as a litigator in Los Angeles. And um, I am here today in part because I think I have a unique perspective on the LA legal industry and how it has evolved and changed from a, uh, a place where uh, law firms in other parts of the country would have satellite offices to a real global leader and a center of law and um, business in Los Angeles. And also to share my perspective 
uh, as someone who litigates for the businesses that are represented on this panel, as to what I've seen over the past few years happen um, uh, in terms of changes in the workforce and COVID-19 litigation and how that's impact uh, the legal landscape for a lot of the companies that have uh, built their homes here. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks to all of you. So we're limited on time because I want to leave time for Q and A. Um, so we're going to have, this is not a speed round, but let's try to keep our, our, our answers somewhat concise, but still thorough. Um, you, you, especially for the three middle portions, although Ario and Arwen could chime in on this, um, labor drives industry. Um, you guys alluded to it. The ability to attract and retain qualified labor is necessary. And it's whatever, you know, if you are a company looking to make a location decision, um, you look at the labor pool. And most companies don't look like, can I get the people I need to start a business today? They look to see whether or not I have a pool of labor that will sustain me for 20 plus years. I plan to be here. And there's a lot that goes into that. So uh, with all that being said, with labor, with the longevity that your companies have had here, um, and to another extent, the diversity within labor, when I say diversity, I mean the diversity of skill sets, barrier of entry in order to be involved today. I, you guys seem to run the gamut. And I want you to talk about that because as we're talking about equitable economic solutions for Angelinos and beyond, we need to see what sort of career opportunities lie within each industry that we maybe haven't tapped into to make sure that we're building up a pipeline to service that. For aerospace and for pharmaceuticals, you guys, of course, we know all the white coat research people and the doctors, but you also spoke to manufacturing. Can you talk about the kind of the breadth of the type of skill sets that are required and whether or not we are deficient on any of those in the Los Angeles region that can prove to be a challenge in, in the future. Uh, let's start with Arwen. So, yeah, I think we, the, uh, the white coat's a, a good analogy. A lot of the people wearing the white coats, if you see a picture of our satellites are actually technicians. And, and you see, if you see pictures back to the Webb Space Telescope, if you see that, that whole satellite being put together, probably 50, 60% of them were technicians. Uh, they do not have a bachelor's degree, but they are doing very precise work. They are they're create, they're integrating the pieces of the satellite together. They're testing it. Uh, that is incredibly complex, detailed, demanding work to very high standards. So the workforce that does that, we can't take people just right out of high school and put them on a satellite. We need them to go through a registered apprenticeship program. We've had the Aeroflex program with El Camino College for 40 years, uh, bringing people in. Some of those people stay as technicians and have long careers with our company, good paying jobs, good benefits. Some of them actually advance, get their degrees and become you know, engineers, senior engineers within the company. The really the thing we need to keep going is that pipeline. Keep feeding that pipeline. There, are, I think, 118 post-secondary uh, education institutions in in just in LA County. We need that pipeline to keep coming, and we need everyone in that pipeline because we have we are you know an aging workforce in aerospace and defense writ large. Like I said earlier, a lot of the baby boomers are retiring, so we need to have them replaced. So that it's it's all to for us, whether it's a technician, whether it's a, a, a you know bachelor's or master's trained uh, engineer or scientist, we we need those institutions uh, to keep investing in programs that bring the local workforce in. Thank you. Want to chime in, Beth? Yeah. So in in general, we we don't really have much of an issue attracting workers, um, especially the the manufacturing jobs. Those are highly sought after and. Once people get those jobs, they, they tend to stay. We have very low turnover in our manufacturing um, pool. You know, it's probably a 3% turnover. Um, there are a few areas though that it, where it is a little more difficult to attract workers. Um, and I would say one area is around um, auto automation. So all of our manufacturing processes are, are fully automated. And so we need people to write code uh, to, to, to do the automation. And so, 
that's a, a workforce that's it's it's highly sought after. Um, there, there just aren't enough to um, to really, I think, adequately fill our needs. And so, um, so I, I would say that's one area: automation and, and programmers. People can program automation is one area where we need more help. Okay, and I have a, a specific question for you, Kelly, on the same um, sort of in, in, in the ballpark. Okay, um, the state of California's Apprenticeship and Workforce, Workforce Innovation Unit is responsible for developing registered apprenticeships programs on behalf of the administration. Um, can you talk about some of the partnerships you formed and some of the investments the governor has made in this space? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mentioned in my introductory remarks that uh, we do a lot of development work in sectors like IT and healthcare, biotech, logistics, financial services, our public sector, among many others. We have, over the last half decade, um, since the formation of this unit, developed partnerships with some of the marquee industry giants in some of these sectors, including Kaiser, Dignity, and Sutter Health, IBM, Sony, CBS, uh, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, and that list goes on. Uh, we also have um, a unique ability to identify opportunities for small and mid-sized businesses as well. As many of us know, they are really um, the backbone of this economic engine that is the fourth largest economy in the world, and we can't leave them behind. Many of them are struggling with um, identifying ways to attract and retain talent because they're competing um, you know, against their larger competitors for this talent. Um, and so it's critically important that we offer recruitment tools that allow for companies to find and attract talent. The reality is there are not enough MIT, Stanford, and Berkeley graduates to fill all of these roles. And the good news is there doesn't have to be. One of the biggest challenges companies face is a skills gap, that lack of continuity and understanding of theoretical work versus the practical ap application. And then technology really outpacing the skill sets of many of our workers. These are real challenges, and it's um, impacting communities, including the greater Los Angeles region, who, for example, is experiencing a 41% vacancy rate in cybersecurity roles. These are roles that protect infrastructure and patient and consumer data, our grids. Um, we have registered apprenticeship programs in cybersecurity. We have registered programs in healthcare roles that allow for care for our workers. The governor sees this, recognizes it, and as a result, has made historic investments to support these efforts, both from the perspective of grant dollars, but also the first of its kind in the nation formula funding, meaning if you have a registered apprenticeship program, you are entitled to reimbursement for programmatic costs for setting up your program, outreach, recruitment, assessment, mentorship, back-end compliance. Also, the cost of academic uh, requirements tied to apprenticeship programs are covered, and they assist workers. And the goal at the end of the day is to help companies be successful, but also create opportunities, especially for those who have been left behind and detrimentally impacted by um, what we've seen over the last couple of years with the um, apocalypse that we've all navigated through. Thank you so much for that. Um, my next question is for you, Yara. I'm gonna keep saying it until I get it correct. Okay. You're, you're doing a good job. I'm trying, yeah. I'm really trying. I said it in my head six times before I just said it a <laughs> lot. Um, you know, we live in Hollywood and Hollywood is as much of an idea and a brand and an industry as it is a physical location. And we are probably around the world more identified with being Hollywood than just about anywhere else. Um, and obviously this is the birthplace of, of film okay, and, and content creation. And entertainment as one of our legacy businesses um, seems to be um, globalized in regards to where content is shot as well, whether it's Georgia or Canada, other jurisdictions, the UK. I mean, we have Amazon Studios. And before I left the mayor's office, one of my major tasks was to build up our studio capacity here within the city. So tell me, do you think that we are in jeopardy of Los Angeles not being the, the sole kind of a mecca for content creation because of whether it's the film tax credits, whether it's because of studio capacity, because or because of other jurisdictions building up their uh, reservoir of different incentive programs. 
maybe labor availability for those skill sets to fall below the, the line. What, what are your thoughts on this, the health of us maintaining our role as the I mean, I think you made uh, very reasonable points when it comes to other areas, but I do still feel that um, LA will continue to thrive in regards to entertainment and media and information. Um, one of the largest markets, obviously, in information and in news being here in uh, Los Angeles and um, Southern California in general. Um, I feel like LA will continue to, to grow in terms of creativity. We've seen and we experienced it throughout the pandemic. Um, I feel like cl I'm closely related to all this in news and information where we had to adapt quickly to the changing models of digital media, right? Like we all uh, use our phones now to go on Twitter to check news. We watch our shows on HBO through our phones or our iPads. So everything is becoming like just much faster when it comes to innovation and technology. And I do uh, really believe that LA is um, a leading force. You know, we have so many creative minds, so many creative spaces. We continue to be a leader in, in all these platforms. And, and at Univision, you know, we've seen it and we saw it through the, the pandemic when we had when we became the fastest growing uh, company um, when we uh, connected with Televisa and VIX becoming uh, one of the highest uh, downloaded platforms, um, apps on, on any platform. So I, I do feel like one Spanish entertainment, Spanish information is key, uh, to anything that we do here in entertainment in Los Angeles. And I don't, I don't, I don't see it being the case. Yes. Are these other places, um, uh, you know, thriving as well, but I think there is space for, for, for a lot of these companies and areas to grow. You know, and I'm going to um, ask um, for Kelly and Arwen to chime in. Do you, have, do you guys have entertainment clients as well, Arwen? Yes, we do. Yeah. Can you tell me what you're seeing or you're in in regards to that? And then um, perhaps Kelly can chime in on if you guys are doing any sort of apprenticeships that will affect this industry. Sure. Well, to build on what you said, I think um, content and creativity in Los Angeles continue to just dominate. And um, I represent companies like Netflix and Warner and Disney, who obviously face challenges during the pandemic, but also see, saw um, a lot of growth in subscriptions and um, innovation. And there's been um, a lot of uh, litigation around protecting content and making sure that um, the, the creativity it continues to be fostered in those industries. So I agree, I think LA is still going to lead and I think it's just going to be um, a, a globalized, but still with a heart in Los Angeles. Thank you. Yeah, we actually just recently um, inked a partnership with Netflix and with DreamWorks. And this is really about creating more equity uh, within the entertainment space. Um, this is also dovetailed into a youth apprenticeship initiative that I think you're going to be hearing a lot about. And the focus of it is, again, to upscale workers into this ever-changing, ever-evolving industry that sees technology, again, outpacing the knowledge and skills and abilities of its workforce. One example of that is the stagecraft technology that many movie studios are using and deployed during the pandemic to create virtual movie sets. That's all technologically driven. And without having a workforce that can run this technology, it really limits their ability to um, mitigate costs associated with it and to create production opportunities um, to navigate future uh, challenges that may exist beyond what we're currently seeing in the pandemic. But at the end of the day, um, we're seeing in the entertainment industry, not unlike a lot of other sectors, a woefully inadequate representation of diversity. And this is one step toward addressing that and allowing for these movie studios and other audio and visual um, employers to get the skilled workforce that they need because it transcends race, gender, any population, it's about learning and helping our economy thrive. That's great that you bring it up because um, it's multifaceted. Um, like I said, I'm originally a Michigan native. And one of the most dynamic things about Los Angeles is that we are such a, one of polycentric megapolis. There's no one area that totally just defines Los Angeles. We have an industrial core, we have an office core, we have a research, we have all these different industries. 
And it also keeps us from having a, the same sort of lows that you would have if you were dependent on one industry, which is why I bring up Michigan, like the automotive industry there. So with all that being said, we can't take that for granted. So we need to make sure that this legacy business, which is entertainment stays here, which not to steal the thunder from one of the other breakout sessions goes to the real estate component. You need a place to produce this content. And many of our studios are aged out and almost hundred years old, if not older. So we need to find a way to update those to keep that so that we can put the, the, the workers in there, all right? So on, on that note, I wanted to ask a quick question. This may go across all of you guys for the most part, but how has the pandemic affected your business and your ability to operate? Like what's, what's one of the major things that you can walk away from this? Like we survived it obviously, but we had a lot of wounds that came from this specific experience. You want, you want to start, Arwen? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. That's a really good question. I think we, the biggest challenge we had um, is in our supply base. So, you know, we have, we're a large company. We have the resources to take care of our people, to manage the impact. The problem is if you just, for example, look at at a typical satellite that we produce, 50% of that satellite can come from a small business, can come from suppliers, other components. It's not just screws. It's it's value added products, big parts for computers or radios, and those small businesses didn't have the resources we had to get through the pandemic. Several, some of them struggled. Some of them went out of business. So it, it is really working with them and keeping that supply chain healthy and robust. I think that's the biggest lingering impact we have. And so to Kelly's earlier point about the importance of supporting uh, small businesses, you know, we we have partnerships with 2000 small businesses across the state. I think last year we spent something like $1.5 billion on contracts with small businesses. Um, having, continuing to support them and have them be healthy and robust, and in some cases get back to the level of performance they were pre-pandemic is really essential for us. And I'd say for aerospace and defense to keep thriving in LA and California, having that small business base that we rely on be healthy. That's really the, the key thing, the key recovery step we still need to work through. Uh, how about you, Ari? Um, The pandemic was really interesting for us. Uh, I feel like in information, news and media, and it affected, I want to say, almost every sector within entertainment and here in Los Angeles where everybody had to go home. Um, But we provide information and news daily. So a lot of us, I never got to go home to work from home. I had to be in the studio um, kind of handling the morning uh, break, breaking news space where every day there was breaking news, right? When at the beginning of the pandemic, if you guys can remember, it seems so long ago, right? But it would just happen. Um, and I think it, it, it really shaped uh, these, these spaces to move um, to catch up with technology, right? To to send our reporters home and them sending our, their, their stories through their phone, filming a lot of their stuff, a lot of the stories themselves. Um, even our photographers or our producers producing from home. Donna G was, was at home doing radio for most of the pandemic as well. So it was, it, I felt like it, it helped us move a little faster and catch up to everything that was happening and become also a leader in information within the digital spaces where we're all consuming information every day from social media um, and making sure that was um, like first in anything that we were doing, right? Making sure that we were also providing information and resources and connections through our social media. Um, We thrived during the pandemic because of that, Um, you know, not only our newscasts and our ratings and our numbers, but also in in the number of of views that we had on digital and social would continue to be at the at the forefront of of everything we do. Wow. Yeah. Um, Patrick. Yeah. So um, our our challenges in in the pharmaceutical and biotech industry are also supply chain related, but but for a, a different reason, I think. We, we were impacted by what's called the um, Defense Production Act. So this is a, a law that where the executive branch can stipulate that certain companies have to produce certain products. And so both uh, President Trump and President Biden utilized this act. 
and they, they mandated that companies that provide supplies to the vaccine manufacturers, the, the COVID vaccine manufacturers, that they had to prioritize the supplies to, to, to those um, vaccine manufacturers. So as a result, the, the rest of the pharmaceutical industry um, had a hard time getting supplies because um, things like, like filters or chemicals that, that we need, um, the companies that produce those were, were predominantly producing for the vaccine manufacturers. So, so we all had to scramble to figure out you know, alternative ways to, to make our products. And so that, that, was, that was a struggle for a while. The situation has eased somewhat, um, but it's not completely gone. So that's, that's the struggle we're facing. Okay. Um, can you uh, chime in on that at all, Arwen and uh, Kelly, on, on, the, on the, what the pandemic did to you guys? Sure. So in the legal industry, there was an initial um, belt tightening, but then with all of the issues that the pr- pandemic presented, um, there was actually a real demand for legal services and advice and an, an uptick in litigation at a time that the courts were actually closed and not hearing cases. So uh, there were all these new issues to learn, all these clients and um, individuals and businesses in need of service and access to justice was limited. So that was a real challenge for the industry. It presented a lot of opportunities for being nimble and flexible and growing. But at the same time, a lot of the legal workforce had shifted to being remote. And so um, we had to adapt just as quickly as our clients did and still try to provide that, you know, really time critical service and advice when there wasn't necessarily an, an outlet to go seek relief from the justice system. And then relatedly, um, one byproduct I've noticed from the past few years of being remote and slowly coming back to the workforce that I don't think is unique to the legal industry is that um, training the next generation of lawyers and leaders in Los Angeles has been challenging. You do lose something when you're working remote um, that uh, uh, you can't quite uh, recreate unless you're in person learning um, certain aspects of the job. And yet at the same time, like I do think hybrid work is going to be here for a while. So we still need to adapt and train people in a way that maybe some of us didn't learn to do. And so those challenges continue. You know, that's a, that's an interesting point. Um, it's changed all of us, but if you are um, like, even one before I came to Amazon, stop bringing on um, interns for the most part, because they wouldn't have the same sort of intern experience because everyone's working remotely. Um, there's something to acclimating to corporate culture, to human interaction that you don't get remotely. Now, if you're mature in your space and you've worked with your colleagues for a number of years, working remotely is not it's not the biggest it's big of a deal. But when you're talking about training up, you know, future leaders of people within your organization, that sort of connectivity to your boss to be able to pop your head in their office and ask a question without scheduling you know, a chime call or something, it's, it's different these days. And I agree with you. Um, we will get back to the office at some point for multiple reasons, but I don't quite see it for at least some time getting back to pre-pandemic levels, which also affects this large real estate community, the demand for space, the floor print, the floor space you're going to need in acquiring space. Now, um, what I want to do is that, um, did, did I ask you, uh, did you get your, your comments in about the pandemic yet, Kelly? I did. Come on, please do. But please I'd love do. to say something about it. It You know, as, as difficult it, as it was to watch over 400,000 Angelinos lost their job in 2020 alone, we saw sectors being incredibly impacted. It did present an opportunity, and that was to take these dislocated workers and provide upskilling and allowing them to pivot into new roles. And the exciting part of that was that so many uh, folks from underserved populations were impacted. So it created a whole new opportunity. One of the other takeaways that we found with the registered apprenticeship model being integrated into organizations was it really uplifted worker voices. We found a lot of career changers, individuals who had epiphanies during the pandemic and really were very moored to this notion of working for organizations that were 
principle to investing in workers. So it wasn't just about where do I want to go and what do I want to do, but what kind of company do I want to work for? And um, when you have organizations that develop uh, like registered apprenticeship programs, that's saying to that worker, we're prepared to invest in you. And that's a really good thing. That's a good thing for workers. It's a good thing for employers. And at the end of the day, um, the pandemic actually created a lot of uh, new opportunities to help people realize their dreams of moving into in demand, what our governor calls high road jobs that are about high quality, good paying jobs, climate mitigation strategies that lift up all communities and provide access and help our employers be successful. That's fantastic. Thank you for that. Now, I want to leave um, some um, time for Q&A in, in the time we have remaining. And uh, as was said earlier, on an optimistic note, um, historically, Los Angeles has always bounced back from any economic downturn faster than other markets across the country, primarily due to the strength and the broadness of our local economy and to the diversity of our local economy and legacy businesses such as these. This has always allowed us, whether it was the Great Recession, whether it was H1N1, even COVID, we, we will bounce back faster. But we have to do it in this way, as Stephen and the LAEDC is really emphasizing, to try to make that economic growth come back in a more equitable fashion. That's where the science and the art both combine. And so um, I wanted to open up for any sort of questions that may be out there. Um, if anyone has a question, this young, okay, go ahead. Ricardo. Hey, Elsa. <laughs> Good morning. And Good morning. it's so nice to see you all. Um, as speaking for another leg legacy industry, the fashion industry, California style is what we're known for. And much like the entertainment business, we're not going anywhere, but it has changed dramatically. It's also a technical industry. It's also an online industry. The major issue and the elephant in the room here is the aging workforce that we all are experiencing and the immigrant workforce or the undocumented workforce that is available. If they have the work permits, they can pick fruit in Fresno and they can't sew a t-shirt. It makes no sense at all. This is a trained opportunity for work permits. And I don't see any facet of any industry addressing that. Um, you, you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, I can. I just worked alongside of our labor commissioner, state labor commissioner on a garment worker initiative that's going to take place right here in Southern California. It's going to create a worker center, a co-op if you will, that uh, creates investment for those workers to be part of the organization, drive the organization and create signatory contracts with uh, different companies to ensure job quality, job safety, good wages. And we are looking at developing registered apprenticeship programs to not only um, integrate new people into that space, but to upskill them into stackable roles that are relatable into management and other types of things. So um, we do have to protect this industry because it has historically been exploited, but you're right, it's not going away. And the solution to that is to create integrity to the industry and offer opportunities for those workers who choose to be in it. Sorry. Yeah. Maybe I misunderstood. Yeah, your yeah you keep going back to cut and sew and basic manufacturing that mm -hmm. may never come back. We're talking about the the uh, economics of technology, the same issues, warehousing, mm -hmm. uh, all of the issues that are way above basic minimum wage salaries. And we're talking about 14 schools that have designed curriculums that are oversubscribed. So it's an industry that is a legacy industry, but it's an industry of entrepreneurs. Elsa, so, I, I think that um, this would be, that issue in and of itself is something that LAEDC would like to hear a lot more about, to be educated. I know I'm educated because we're friends and we had dinner together speaking about these issues, but I think that, um, I, I think that should be more widely known because you're right, this is, you know, we were um, the Los Angeles, like one of the, the manufacturing capitals 
in, uh, in the country um, in regards to garment manufacturing. A lot of people didn't know that. And so it is a, a stable legacy business that we want to keep here. And the industry is evolving and how we can help to uh, update our workforce to be able to accommodate the labor needs. That's something that's very important. And so the LAEDC should speak with you to discuss that. We have any other questions out there? Sure. Oh. From our community, our Spanish speaking community, about opportunities. Hi. Um, I have the opportunity to share information for our Spanish speaking communities about opportunities. Um, what is the interest of what percentage of Latinos are actually taking advantage of the opportunities that you guys offer? And how can we assist as a communications industry to make sure that they hear about the opportunities and excel in those apprenticeships? Yeah, that's such a great question. So first of all, um, in terms of the demographics of our registered apprenticeship programs, we have a fairly diverse population spanning different sectors. Um, we also are embarking on a more intentional and strategic approach to getting the word out to different types of communities about these opportunities. A lot of um, the awareness is really centered around the building and construction industry. And so what we wanna do is open up that aperture to find ways to educate, um, including Spanish speaking folks about um, you know, jobs in IT and healthcare. And so we're starting to develop some marketing and communication strategies about the various initiatives that we're working on. And the governor, has definitely prioritized ensuring that um, these materials and PSAs and things that we do are going to be broadcast, um, you know, across to all different um, demographics. And then I just wanted to say quickly to Elsa, part of that component includes mechatronics and robotics and some of the more technologically advanced areas. And I would love to talk to you offline more specifically about your interests and ways that we might um, be thought partners and how to address that. Ms. Green. Morning. Uh, my name is Sandra Arana, and I'm a director for Career Center at a small liberal arts college. And, you know, I think you all mentioned internships and apprenticeship and, you know, opportunity and changes. We've seen a lot of changes, right? A lot of our students definitely have struggled um, in terms of gaining that experience, that exposure, so that they can then sort of figure out what that next step is for them. So I believe, um, you know, someone mentioned about pipelines. How can small institutions um, be sort of be seen by big giants, right? Where we do have talent, but a lot of the times access to conferences or opportunities where they can get exposed and be seen um, for their talent is, is challenging, right? We're not a, your, your top tier school. So how can we, um, you know, different institutions of different sizes be able to connect, be able to create those pipeline programs to have our, our communities, um, you know, know about the different positions, learn about the different um, areas that where they can use their talents and strengths. I, from our perspective, I'd say reach out to us. I'd love to talk to you when, when this is done. We, we have groups that, that conduct outreach to local communities, local institutions. We can connect you with the right folks so we can see what, what opportunities there are. Because we're, we're not, and you know, like I said earlier, our, um, our workforce has alumni from every UC, every CSU um, school, as well as a bunch of the community colleges. We're not all, uh, we're not MIT grads, we're not Stanford grads, or Caltech grads, so we have a lot of Caltech grads. Um, but it is, uh, we need, we need um, a diverse workforce from, you know, for a variety of tasks in a variety of areas. So any institution where there's an opportunity to partner, we, we'd love to talk to you. Yeah, and I'll also just add that we, we, we do partner with a lot of colleges, and, and many of them are, are community colleges. And and we've helped them develop their biotech curriculums uh, because that, that, that two-year biotech curriculum really is a good feeder for um, entry-level jobs um, at our company. And so we're currently working with both Cerritos and Compton College and helping them develop a biotech curriculum. And I'm really hoping to recruit some, um, some employees from, from there in, once they graduate. 
Yeah, and just really quickly, many of you may not be aware, but if you have a registered apprenticeship program and there are community college, if there's community college curriculum tied to it, the cost of the curriculum is covered for the student. So as a part of the program itself, um, you have you have apprentices that are going through and taking the theoretical and what we call related and supplemental instruction, and then they practically apply it on the job. The cost of those classes is covered. So imagine the opportunities that exist. And we have longstanding partnerships with the vast majority of community colleges up and down the state. And increasingly, as we've started to develop more sophisticated, complex roles, relationships with our CSUs and UCs um, in some of these really good paying, high quality um, in demand roles as well. Thank you. And uh, we're winding down, so we're going to close off. I like to be punctual. Um, in closing, uh, what I like to say is that we are in a very unique position. We are the third or fourth largest metropolitan economy on the planet. And there's a responsibility that comes with that. And everyone in this room has embraced that responsibility. And Stephen, our president and CEO, has made it clear that an equitable economic solutions, data-driven, are what he's in his in the LAEDC is going to push at to try to encourage our lawmakers and our broader um, uh, business community to embrace. This includes um, whether it's racial, gender, just equity, to make sure that those underserved areas are no longer underserved. And that's very important. I want to thank all of the panelists that have been up here. Um, obviously, we could go on forever and we could have about six or seven more chairs out here. Elsa would be on one of them. You will be on a throne though, Elsa. I know. <laughs> um, and so, so thank you for deciding to attend this breakout session. And I'm sure that any of the panelists, if you guys want to catch a sidebar with them, they'd love to interact with you. Thanks so much for your time.
Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Please take your seats. The program is going to begin in one minute. Please take your seats. The program will be will resume, I should say, in one minute. Thank you. I know it's always like over right here. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I kindly ask you to have a seat. We are about to wrap this up, and we are very excited to have you back into this beautiful room. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoy the powerful insights from our breakout sessions, and maybe also you had a chance to connect and catch up with colleagues and friends. Um, we are very excited to have you back in this room and ready to also uh, welcome back our president and CEO of the LAEDC, Steven Chung. Hey. Welcome back everybody. Uh, and for those of you who are outside, come on back in. Uh, we're getting ready to start it right now. 
So I hope you enjoyed the powerful insights from the breakout sessions and maybe a chance to catch up with colleagues or friends you haven't seen in a while. I would like to now welcome back, well, that's me. I'm gonna welcome back myself. <laughs> Get too excited, you guys being here. Okay, so uh, our last portion of the economic forecast will be our closing plenary session, which I'm honored to moderate this morning with an extraordinary guest. Mayor Antonio Villagosa is a respected voice in American politics and a prominent policymaker with a keen understanding of America's mainstream and emerging communities. Known for his exceptional skill, at building broad bipartisan coalitions, he draws support from Democratic and Republican voters alike. In 2013, Mayor Viragosa finished his two term as the 41st mayor of the city of Los Angeles after eight years of major strides in transportation, crime reduction, infrastructure, energy, and resource sustainability, right sizing government, uh, business development, education reform. Prior to his election as mayor, uh, Mr. Viragosa served as a member of the Los Angeles City Council from 2003 to 2005, and from 1994 to 2000, uh, Mayor Viragosa served as a California State Assembly as Democratic Whip, Majority Leader, and the Speaker of the Assembly. He was the 2012 Chairman of the Democratic National Convention and President of the U.S. Conference of Mayor. In August of 2022, Governor Newsom named Mr. Viragosa to serve as Infrastructure Advisor to the State of California, Mr. Villagrosa is currently a partner and co-chair at Actum, where he focuses on strategic and crisis communication consulting to senior executive in large and public private sector organizations. I had the privilege of working for the mayor um, when I was mentioning earlier, uh, when I first started out in City Hall. And in the five years I was with him, I had about eight different positions, got to see the world and got to really see Los Angeles in a very deep way. And um, we'll talk more about those experiences as well. But ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mayor Antonio Villagosa. <laughs> Take that picture down. That was 25 years ago. <laughs> so welcome, Mayor. So as uh, we were discussing earlier, we had an amazing opening session uh, looking at the economic forecast, looking what's going to happen to the U.S. state and local economy, followed by Dr. Hamilton's uh, amazing keynote speech that really pushed us to think about uh, our economy in a very, very different way. And then we broke down into three different um, panels, looking at commercial real estate, looking at small business, looking at uh, transition uh, of new economies as well and new industries. So now we're back. And one of the really major focus for this entire region is infrastructure. We've been seeing that there are a lot of potential dollars that are coming in and we're not quite sure what's been happening. So want to get your thoughts and get your uh, uh, experience on this as well. So as we start, can you tell us a little bit more about your role as an infrastructure advisor to the state of California? What does that mean? What does that entail? Well, first of all, I am so proud of you. I mean, you know, I have, um, last night I was at a Broad Foundation event here downtown and uh, there were about a hundred people, eight, nine, maybe even 10 of them worked with me for me alongside of me over the years, all of them with big jobs. Uh, there are a number of you here today. We just took a picture. In fact, we didn't get all of you because some of you were somewhere else and we couldn't take a picture, but uh, I couldn't be prouder of all of you. And uh, to see you in the jobs that you're in uh, leading uh, the town that my grandpa came to a hundred years ago uh, is a real honor and pleasure to see. So, you know, look, um, you were part of it. Jessica's here and Susie's here and uh, Jeff is here and Tracy. Tracy's here. And there's a number of you and, you know, we built more trains, more schools, modernized uh, more community colleges, did more at the airport and the port than virtually anybody in America. And we didn't do it alone. Uh, we did it in the middle of a recession. The worst recession in some ways, I know this last one, you know, but we didn't get all that money that they got to, you know, recompense us for those losses. And I'll tell you something, uh, you know, if I'm advising the governor, it's because of the work that you did and at the port uh, you know, and 
all the other stuff we did. So, you know, it, he what he said was it, it, very gracious of him, by the way. He said something like when, first of all, he called me, uh, his staff said, don't call him czar. It's infrastructure advisor. And the first thing he says was czar. <laughs> Just to kind of needle them like, like I used to do with you all. And also because he wanted to say that somebody was in charge. Actually, I'm, I am advising him. And he's in charge. Um, the second thing he said was um, that the one thing he couldn't say in the course of the campaign was that he got more money for his town than we got for ours. Um, but it wasn't easy. You know, as an example, if you remember, we number two city in the country and we were 16th in transportation dollars. By the time we finished and we'll talk about that later on, we were number one by a lot. And uh, it was because, again, because of the work efforts of all of you, people like Borja and others. So what what's the task? Uh, you know, I've met with more than a thousand stakeholders, uh, stakeholder organizations, uh, certainly more than that uh, in terms of individuals. Um, 33 cities from the Oregon border uh, to the Mexican border. Um, let's put it this way. I was in a town that was three hours north of Eureka. Um, it was, you know, desolate and uh, a place that really hadn't seen uh, much from government. Uh, and we had an opportunity to hear from them about what they think we ought to be investing. In. And I know I heard you say that Mr. Hamilton uh, maybe said some things that might be controversial to some, but let me just say this, shouldn't be to us. You know, California is the fourth largest economy in the world with the highest effective poverty rate in the Western world. You know, we, it, it, the, the notion that when, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, that's not always true, but it has to be. And one of the reasons why the governor uh, put me in this job, not just because we did more infrastructure than anybody in the country, but because we believe in equity and inclusion. And the IIJA, the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, speaks to that. You know, so the days when, you know, you build five freeways where I grew up in Bow Heights and three in South LA, you know, those days uh, are over. And the days when you mitigate on the west side and in Beverly Hills, but not in those communities, it's over. And it shouldn't be controversial because uh, I, I believe that, you know, if you have an economy that doesn't work for so many people, you create radicalism. We've seen it on the right and increasingly on the other side. So that's why, and I'm enjoying it, having a good time. Good. Um, I'm glad you brought up uh, Dr. Hamilton's uh, conversation earlier as well. One of the, the themes that's been going around, I mean, we've been hearing a lot about it is DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and uh, with LADC, we we're mentioning earlier that our, our uh, vision and our mission is equity, uh, sustainability, resiliency, growth, right? And so in order for that to happen, um, representation matters. And today, as we're having this conversation, you've seen LADC's direction and where we're going uh, is really reflective of that. And one of the things that we did earlier is to ask all of the LADC staff to stand up and to, to show um, it represents Los Angeles in a very different way um, that I think a lot of folks are, are, are focusing on. And personally, uh, I just want to thank you because when I was mentioning earlier to you, I was interning for then Assembly Member Karen Bass, and I was hoping to work for your administration. Uh, I, was, I was really worried uh, with the interview because <laughs> I have no political background. I have no financial background. Um, you know, who is this, this, this guy that's coming in? And I remember while working for you, one of the things you said uh, during the administration that really touched me and continued to, to resonate with me is that in Los Angeles, it doesn't matter um, who your father is, whether you have a father or not, like in my case, and in Los Angeles, and really particular to California, whether you have two fathers. Yeah, I used to always hear that. I love that. I love so, that line, by the way, because I didn't have a father, so, so I used it. But. but with the diversity and the representation that's there, now we're talking about what uh, Dr. Hamilton has been talking about. How do you, how do we as a region make sure that the infrastructure dollars are coming in, not only from a mitigation standpoint, how do we encourage 
um, diverse populations and disinvested communities to participate in a way that's meaningful to them? Well, a couple of things. The Biden administration took a page of, out of what we did, the first in the country to do it. You know, we have anti-affirmative action laws here that uh, don't pertain to the federal government. Um, but early on when we were building, you know, I, you're a politician, you want to go and see what you're building, right? So you go on a train uh, project or a building or an airport or a port, you know, I'd ask people, where do you live? Thinking they live, you know, Boyle Heights, you know, West LA somewhere, Temecula, Arizona. And that put in my head, if we're going to invest $40 billion over a 30 year period of time uh, and, you know, build, we've got to put people to work here who voted for that, or even if they didn't vote for it, that is a, at a minimum Liz here. So we did a thing called local hire. We said, we're going to hire apprentices um, that um, live in high poverty, high unemployment census tracts. They could be from any community. By the way, I said I was up north. There are communities up north and they very, you know, European, uh, very few people from Latin America or Asia or Africa like here, 70% um, poverty. So this equity and inclusion doesn't just mean, you know, communities of color. It means people that have been left behind, unemployed, you know, and the like in high poverty areas. So we figured that out. And then what we said was to the unions, did 126 project labor agreements. And I said to them, uh, we're good with union. We believe in unions. I support unions. I just want those unions to look like Los Angeles. And so I said, I don't see African-Americans on construction sites. And we did 2,500 African-American apprentices. I don't see women on construction sites. And now you see more of them. Uh, we're focused on that focused on formerly incarcerated uh, Latinos. Everybody thinks Latinos are, you know, all over construction and they are most of these laborers. And we changed that. I said, I wanna see engineers. I wanna see operating engineers. I wanna see, uh, you know, plumbers and, you know, electricians. So one of the ways that the, the Biden administration taking a page out of what we did here they have focused on equity, on local hire, on um, making sure that as we spread this investment, we're investing everywhere, in every one. You know, you know, we were proud of that. And I know you were. You had them come up and they look like LA's. You know, our, our staff was 70%, uh, you know, Asia, Africa, and Latin America, because guess what? That's what the city is. And the same with our appointments. And last time I looked, you know, had a lot of talent and talent comes from everywhere and just some places. Now, stepping back a little bit um, with the infrastructure dollars that are coming through, there's been so much attention, but how much exactly are we talking about? Well, you know, I put together with uh, Boston Consulting and um, uh, California Forward a document that, uh, you know, given to the governor for now, at some point we'll make public, um, laying out the possibilities. We know that the, the federal government has given us 50 to $60 billion, depending on how well we do on competitive grants, but a minimum of 50, so a bandwidth of 50 to 60. What we don't know is that last year, the state of California put in another $47 billion. So we're looking at, you know, 107 uh, to $110 billion. Uh, never, you know, in such a confined period of time or limited period of time, have we spent that kind of money on um, infrastructure. And so that you understand, like housing is infrastructure and we need housing and schools are infrastructure. But they chose four areas. Transportation, uh, about 70% of the money is going to transportation. Um, energy, 
uh, water and broadband. And, uh, you know, vast majority of it going to transportation on the, you know, if there's any transportation people here on the same old 80, 20 split, 80 highways, 20 um, transit. That makes no sense to me, particularly when we're on because of the issue of climate change, but that's the way the feds did it. Um, I, but I said 110 billion, right? Up to 110 billion. If we were to do diff things differently, the business people who hear the I, I know commercial real estate and all different sectors who are here, let's be honest. And what I said everywhere I went, it takes longer to build and it costs more in California than anywhere else in the United States of America. And we got to change that. What I said was, if we can limit the time to sue to 257 days to build a SoFi, we, Anybody been there? Raise your hand if you've been there. Beautiful, isn't it? Well, you, you limited the time that you could sue, not the five to 10 years that you could sue in this town. By the way, from Arizona, you can sue from Arizona for a project here. In, and then what they do is then they go to the people trying to build something here and say, come to Arizona. You know, we'll build it in two years. So limit the time to sue. Um, like they did for SoFi, like they did for the basketball arena, the Kings arena in Sacramento, um, alternative delivery methods. Do you all remember karma heaven? Cause you guys called it karma getting right. And I said, karma getting's not going to happen under my watch because of people like him. And it didn't. If you remember. That day went smoothly. Why? We didn't do things the old way. We said, we're going to do take a page out of Pete Wilson's book. You were there when I spoke to Pete, well, to a group of Southern California leaders last week. And, you know, earthquake happens. The 10 freeway, Santa Monica freeway goes down or parts of it go down. And he says, hey, we're not doing this the old way. We're going to do design build. We're going to incentivize people to build faster and put a hammer on them if they take too long. And you did it in X number of months. I forgot. He, he I think he corrected me. I, I said it was nine months and I think he said it was two or something. Um, huh? 66 days. Very good. So you did a little Googling while we were talking. I love it. Oh, you remembered. Um, you weren't born yet. <laughs> Come on. Um, so, you know, that we're going to look at alternative delivery methods. Another way to speed up. So design build, progressive design build, job order contracting, uh, PM, um, CM. Um, it, how about something novel? Public-private partnerships. I just met a Dane right now who wants to talk infrastructure. You know, in Europe, in Latin America, in Asia, virtually, you know, a good portion of the infrastructure get, gets built. It's the government and the private sector. This is the one place in the world where we do very little uh, public-private partnerships. It's a way, because you asked, I'm getting back to the point. You, I said up to $110 billion, but if you're, stream, if, if, if you're limiting the time to sue, shorten the time to build, if you're doing alternative delivery methods, um, and finally, streamlining permitting, which they could do on their own, and they're already, the governor's office is already in the process of doing that. We've taken uh, uh, broadband from 33 months to 16, and we're going to take it to 11. So if you rethink how we build, you could build faster for less money like they do in some of those red states. Frankly, I, I wouldn't want to live in those states, but, you know, we got to look at what others are doing around the world. And that's what I've done in the course of the last seven months or so, you know, talk to the best and the brightest about smarter ways to build cheaper, better, and more inclusive, because as I said, the IIJA, talks about equity and inclusion being an important part.
Um, and to the audience member, we want to make this an interactive uh, uh, in, uh, session. So if you have questions, start uh, thinking in your head. We're going to be bringing a mic around so that you can ask questions. Um, I have one more question before we go there. That's a nice sweater you got. I thought I was going to be like the only one. I, I said, I'm not wearing a suit. <laughs> it's cold. I'm triple layered. I said last night at that event, I was outside waiting for an Uber and I was freezing. I said, I'm not doing that again. I think we've gone soft here in uh, Los yes, Angeles. Yes, we have. <laughs> it's 54 degrees and we're freezing. <laughs> Is it 54 today? It's probably 54. But yesterday was like 44. Yes, it was. <laughs> With wind chill factor. <laughs> So my next question is really uh, on a very selfish level. You know, as a Los Angeles County Economic Development Corporation, I want to make sure that Los Angeles gets our fair share of the dollars. Um, recently, uh, the U.S. federal government, through the Economic Development Corpor uh, uh, Age, uh, Administration, sorry, issued a number of different grants, including Good Job Challenge, including Build Back Better Regional Challenge. Amazing projects, but um, at the end of the day, throughout California, Central Valley, and um, Fresno uh, got both of those grants uh, totaling up to $100 million. Uh, good for them. But we got zero here. And I was mentioning to you that uh, during our economic research impact report that we did for the county in 2021, in the first two months of COVID, LA County lost 780,000 jobs. And it took us two years to get those jobs back. That's the size of that entire region. Yet at the same time, we got zero dollars. What can we do here to ensure that we get our fair share down in Southern California, especially Los Angeles County? Well, when the governor asked me to do this on the, on the call, I said, look, um, I'm not gonna be a front for all the money that goes to the Bay Area any more than you should be a front for money that goes to LA. So I, I don't represent LA here, I represent the state. And I have to advise them on the best projects in the state. But I'll tell you, I've gone up and down the state and nobody does it better in the Bay Area. Let me tell you why. All the business groups, they have a set of priorities, all the business groups on the same priorities. The mayors, big city mayors, small city mayors on the same priorities. The assembly members, the senators, and they had the speaker at the time and for a long time, two senators, all on the same page. That doesn't happen here. It doesn't happen here. And so, you know, when you're all swimming in the same direction, you go further. Um, with respect, let me correct a little bit here, though. LA did get 680 million plus for uh, the uh, north-south uh, line, um, it, we got another hundred and it was before I got there, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it, something like 160, 180 million at the port. We got um, uh, a big chunk of money close to, I don't want to misstate, for the Inglewood connection at Wi-Fi uh, to SoFi, uh, we, we've gotten some dough and Lacey just got, which we did uh, um, downtown, uh, just got some grant money too. But look, we're the second largest city in the country. And I always, I was very aggressive about bringing the bacon home. And he was right about that, that, it, you know, we brought a lot of money in, in the worst times. But I'll tell you, it was tough. I was talking with uh, someone, I won't give their name right now, last night for dinner, but they run a big organization and we were talking about when I did congestion pricing. Bloomberg failed. That's the, the 110 freeway, you know, that lane, that hot lane. Everybody, do you know it? And then on the 10, going to San Gabriel Valley, I think it was 400 million or something, big, big chunk of money. Uh, Bloomberg couldn't get the region behind it. Uh, Newsom couldn't get the Bay Area behind it. And I went to Bush and said, I want that money. You don't know what a war it was. The Dems said, oh, if you charge, you're hurting poor people. 
the 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 reap said freeways ought to be free we already paid for it the entire delegation was against it the entire assembly and senate and the legislature was against it we finally got it and of course my chief of staff who's here or former chief of staff uh, said to me um you know you have to call all those people that were against it and you got to thank them for opening it i said i'm not doing that no, sorry, you got to thank them for opening it. And I ended up doing that, but upset. So the point is we got to row in the same direction, everybody. You know, we're so big, you know, uh, you just corrected, I guess it's not a, a county of 10 million anymore. It's a county of 9.8 or 9 million. Uh, the same with the city, we were something close to 4 million. And now I think we're probably three, I don't know, three, eight or so. Um, you know, we've lost a lot of people. Uh, it's a big county and we need to get our fair share. So I can't advocate for LA, but I can tell you, and I've said this to Fresno, I've said this to San Diego, look at what the Bay Area does. They do it right. Yeah. They get, oh, labor, labor's there too. So usually here, you know, there's labor. and business. No, they're all, and the enviros, yeah. the environmental stakeholders, they're all on the same page. You get success with that. Question from the audience. Um, Alex, I think you were breaking it up. Oh, Ricardo. Question, please. Thank you. Uh, Barry Waite, mayor of the major metropolis of Lomita. So with a population slightly larger than this building of 22,000 roughly. And being a native Angelino, I, I think I can speak for all of us when I say, we're com comfortable from 70 to 74 without whining. <laughs> But anyway, so I want to go back in time. Let's take the way back machine because we're going to need to jump back to this, which is 1984 with the Olympics. So there was no traffic. There was no crime. There was no pollution. It was an amazing time to be here. Those who are old enough, those few of us who are willing to admit it was amazing, wasn't it? Well, guess what? We're doing it again in a few years. We're having the Olympics, that is. Are we going to rise to that challenge, not just as a, a local community, but you know, for the whole state, are we gonna be able to pull together and do the amazing things like we did last time with the only modern Olympics ever to turn a profit that's still paying dividends to youth programs today? First of all, let me say as the former president of the Conference of Mayors who, and I've said it a hundred times, the only difference between you and me is the size of the stage. The job of mayor is the same. And so I respect the fact that uh, uh, former mayor, and by the way, everywhere I met, I said, I used to be speaker and all that stuff, but I said, I want to meet mayors because they got boots on the ground. Uh, they know what their constituents want. So thank you for that. You know, look, I'm not mayor anymore, so I'm not intimately involved in all the preparations, but what you didn't mention, we're gonna have a World Cup too. And we're gonna have a few, that a, a couple of years before that. So we gotta start focusing now. Um, and, um, you know, I think we can turn a profit. You know, I'm a big fan of Casey Wasserman, known him since he was a teen. And to watch him, another one friend, just where he's gone and, I have a lot of confidence in that team. I think the mayor is focused. I know she's focused on it. And um, we got a lot of work to do, I, you know, but I'm not intimately involved with that. Some of the infrastructure, <coughs> excuse me, money that will, you know, including that Inglewood project, uh, you know, will be, you know, uh, related to preparations for a great Olympics and uh, hopefully a great World Cup. Um, even though I'm not answering a question, I might jump in here out of it. This is something that LADC has been focusing on for a while as well. Um, 
to your point, Mayor, it's not just Olympic and Paralympic Games. It's not just the World Cup. In 2032, we're also up for the World Rugby uh, Championship and the uh, the Female Rugby Championship in 2032. Before that, um, we, we've already had the Super Bowl. Um, we have uh, Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer, All-Star Game. Uh, we will have the U.S. Open this year. Uh, and then we have the LPGA U.S. Open here. We also have WrestleMania. And I was corrected recently that WrestleMania is not uh, really a sports but an entertainment so it can be included but still i mean these are major events that are happening here so this is going to create a huge industry for for us moving in the future so one of the things that we're hoping to do as we're mentioning earlier with a five pillar approach is that could the sports entertainment industry be one of those sectors that we're going to focus on so we have an economic blueprint we welcome your participation and we welcome your feedback so that we can build this blueprint to make sure that we're able to have another profitable and successful olympic Olympic, Paralympic Games, but that will last beyond uh, 2028. We're really looking at 2040 and beyond. So really would like to encourage you all to uh, participate in that as well. Other questions? Mm. Wow. Oh, please. Mayor Villagarosa, I'm going to give you, I think, a hard hitting question, but I'm warning you in advance. Um, I'm in the I business look, of hard hitting questions, my <laughs> friend, and always answer them with a smile. And I was a supporter of yours when you uh, ran for mayor. You Thank probably you. don't remember. Um, the vast amount of money that we're spending on um, my term, the bullet train to nowhere, I would love to see that redirected into what I think are much more uh, effective infrastructure and we can all debate what it would be but for example uh public transit if we spent it at both ends in the bay area and sacramento and la and san diego as opposed to all of the money we're spending going up the central valley and i think the single most important infrastructure item in the state of california to to sustain just what we have is our water infrastructure, which is woefully inadequate for what we know is coming with the droughts and the environmental uh, catastrophe. Can you comment on that as the infrastructure czar? <laughs> and thank you for that. And and I don't see that as a hard hitting question. You know, I, I, I like the governor in the, in the governor's race and we debated dozens of times. We actually agreed on high-speed rail, and I'll tell you why. I said, some people see this as a, a transportation project. I see this as an economic development and housing project as well. And people said, well, what are you saying? I said, well, I have a little experience with that. When we built all these trains, I said to people, close your eyes, and I would, and I said, this isn't just about moving people. This is about reimagining LA. We need more housing. We need to lessen traffic. And the best way to do that is to live closer where you work and recreate. So I support high-speed rail because I've been all over the world and I've seen what high-speed rail can do for travel. I've seen how it could take the burden off. Anybody been to LAX lately? I mean, the traffic, and yes, because of the construction that me and then later, uh, you know, uh, Garcetti did, but, you know, we needed to make that those investments in, in uh, you know, aviation and at the largest destination and arrival uh, and, departure airport in the United States. So I am for it. We both believed it and people criticized us and they were well to do that. And some of that criticism, you know, it's, it, I could understand that viewpoint. We started in the Valley because the Valley is the place along with LA with the highest effective poverty rate in the United States. Okay. I mean, in, in California and in the United States. And so with housing being what it costs in the Bay Area and L.A., it's a bedroom community in many respects with high-speed rail. 
And, you know, I tell people we could build it now or we could build it 20 years from now. But the world is going to have high speed rail as a way to move people, um, not through aviation. Now, if we do permitting, if we can limit streamlines of permitting, if we could do alternative delivery methods, if we could bring the private sector in with us um, building some of these projects, including that one, you can reduce the cost, accelerate the time to build. So that's high-speed rail. And I didn't see it as hard, you know, it's my view. People could have another view, and I think half of California does. <laughs> uh, so, but secondly, water. You know, I said 70% of the money is going uh, to transportation. If I were to be critical, uh, and I'm not critical, but if, if there was a, a criticism of the feds, is they didn't put enough money for water. Now, I'm, I also have responsibility over the Inflation Reduction Act, which are the energy credits that are going to be coming, primarily the private sector, uh, to do energy projects. But there really wasn't enough money for water. And I've been saying to the governor that um, we've got to put a strategy together. I've given him a plan to go back and focus particularly on the Central Valley. Uh, you know, there, there are places in the Central Valley, Mayor, that don't have clean drinking water, lots of them. I was visiting um, the Inland Empire, I was in Riverside, and we were with a supervisor who was doling out cases of water so people could bathe in. That's what we have in California. So I'm 1000% with you on the water issue, by the way, Governor was criticized for uh, the other day on the water issue because he said, we're not gonna divert as much, let some of that water go to agriculture. And of course he got a, you know, some criticism for it. I called him, I said, you did the right thing. What, you know, ag, you know, and, and the Valley and Imperial and some of those other places, we feed the country. Uh, and some of the world. And, you know, it may be as some who love to criticize ag because they don't work in the fields and they're not a farmer um, say, well, they're only 8% of the California economy. Well, you kill 8% here, you kill another 8% here. Look at commercial. Real I mean, all the stuff that we do in this state and, you know, in the city and the like, there goes the economy. So this water issue, really important. Um, and governor's got a good plan, but we got to accelerate it and we got to make sure that, you know, at a minimum, everybody has a right to clean drinking water. Uh, and you know, we have enough water to grow our crops, enough water, uh, to, you know, do, do the housing, you know, I don't know if you know, but when you build housing, you have to have a, a water plan, right? We talked about that a few minutes ago for the commercial real estate people that are looking at what can you do with these empty buildings? Well, if you don't have water, you can't turn them into housing. So we've got to do a lot more on, on water in this state and in the country. And I want to tell you that with the Colorado River being where it is today and all those states fighting each other, um, we'll, we got a lot of work to do. Thank you. And thank you for your support. I do remember your face. Don't remember your name, but I do remember your face. Uh, before next question, Mayor, you're talking a lot about the funding that's coming in. It seems like in the past, at least, the funding that's coming in is also usually supporting the building of the infrastructure, but not the operation. Do you think that there's going to be funding that we can leverage or, or use for the operation? I said I had dinner last night uh, with someone uh, runs in big agency. And the one thing in those meetings with thousand stakeholders and, you know, 33 cities, what I heard again and again from the transportation agencies, one, this money is being doled out on the same old 80-20 split. Two, there's no money for operations. 
And, you know, it's point well taken with an exclamation point. And we're going to have to figure that out. If, if, you know, everybody loves to make fun of my subway to see when they open it up, you know, we'll have the last laugh, just like we did on the exposition line. Uh, at the end of the day, it takes a long time to build this stuff, but a lot of money to run it. And we're, we're, we're going to have to figure that out. Problem is, the other argument for the, a blue state to build faster and cheaper, I remember the hearings on the bridge that went to nowhere. Remember all that? Watch what's going to happen soon because a lot of them didn't vote for it. In fact, very few of them voted for it. I think like maybe a dozen in the House and uh, you know, a couple in the Senate. It, 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 you're going to see the hearings. Why does it cost so much? Why does it take so long? Why aren't you doing more? So that's the other argument for accelerating this, because I said it could be 110 billion. You cut, by the way, what we did here, you do CEQA and NEPA together. I was the first person in the country to convince both the Democrats and the Republicans, why are we doing CEQA, which is the most vigorous environmental review in the country, and then doing NEPA after that, which is inferior to it. I mean, every, we covered that on steroids and put another two years on a project. So, um, you know, we want to do that together. We need to think of all the ways to accelerate so that 110 could be even more. Question over there. Good morning, Salvatrice of Pasadena City College. Thank you for sharing the, the Bay Area model. It's a model that I personally have been looking at. Um, and one of the things that I struggle with is us as an LA collective. What would you advise us as, you know, as a leader in this space, as other emerging leaders in the space? What first steps or what should we be doing now to take that first step to us um, coming to an agreement? on what this collective same page looks like um, in various areas. I mean, there's so many pillars um, within the work that we do, but even just taking the pillar of small business, what would be a first step for us as an LA collective to do to get on that same page? I think you'd need to talk to our elects and say, you know, this model works. We all got to row in the same direction. We got to identify the, the best projects. You know, when I was mayor, not Stephen, but, you know, some of my transportation uh, people would tell me sometimes, because you have to go to the MTA for a lot of that stuff. They'd say, you know, our number one project is X. You got to get the MTA to fund it. The MTA would say, um, no, this is actually a better project. And it's not in the city, but it's a better project. It can compete nationally. And, you know, Half a dozen times or so, I went with them. Why? Because I then had credibility to talk for the region because I was focused on the best projects. That's what we have to do here. We have to focus on the best projects. Um, you know, maybe they're in the city, maybe they're not, but maybe they're in LA County or just in the region. That's how you win. So uh, first thing I do is talk to our electeds. The business community has a lot of strength. Use it. Use that muscle. Work with labor. I mean, look, these project labor agreements that I did and that the feds are going to do, they're going to happen. So make it work for you. Make them an ally to push for these projects. So that's some of what I would do. One more question. I think it's right here. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, uh, Stephen, for allowing one more question. I'm going to follow up on the gentleman here. We, I'm sure, in this room have total agreement about the highest priority of water in the state of California. I'm going to ask that the mayor and um, the LAEDC maybe form a new collaboration because uh, and I don't know if either of you are aware of this, but I, I have files that I can certainly make you aware of it. But going back about eight years ago, 
uh, work was done with NASA JPL, and we looked at tapping the Columbia River for fresh water, and NASA JPL looked at the uh, potential of an underground composite water pipeline that would be pretty large diameter composite. Discussions have been held, I'm, and I'm aware, between California and Oregon politicians. But estimates at that time were about 2 million acre feet could be diverted without disturbing the salmon from water that was fresh water running from the Columbia River, mixing with the salt water. So this is water that has made it through all the contractual requirements of water along the Columbia River. This is water that is going out and mixing with salt water and becoming virtually worthless, not quite for fresh water. A lot of work was done. In addition, and I have to disclose I'm on a confidentiality agreement, but I can provide information before I sign that agreement, that, that a major global engineering firm, which would be a name brand to almost everybody in this room, uh, did a feasibility analysis, and they found that there was no critical reason why it couldn't be done. NASA JPL looked at the construction. They looked at having the pipeline be subsea, about 300 feet beneath the surface of the ocean on the continental shelf. This has all been done, and I would ask, Mayor, with your position, and Stephen, with your connections, if you don't know about this, it is for some reason not being enacted because it economically makes sense. It would lessen the aqueduct drying in the Central Valley. You mentioned the Central Valley, uh, the subsidence in the Central Valley because so many of the deeper aqueducts are being tapped. The land is dropping four inches, eight inches, 12 inches a year because the water being drawn out for the Central Valley is needed. And the, this water would, would go a long way to resolving the uh, California water shortages. And I'm asking if you're not aware of it, that we really work. And I would give you another tip, if I may, that the co-founders of BizFed are, are aware of this. So Stephen, I strongly suggest that we really figure out how to get momentum behind this effort. Okay. So that's, thank you. First of all, my email is for the, for these purposes is Antonio at CA, like California, FWD, like forward.org. So Antonio at CA, FWD.org. My phone number is 213-590-1376. Uh, if you got an idea like that, I've heard tangentially about a project like this. Uh, my recollection like high speed rail has an astronomical cost to it, not to mention um, all of the environmental, you know, things you'd have to do. But send me, since you can still, send me the deck on this and, uh, you know, be more than happy to pass it over to the expert. I'm not a subject adder, uh, matter expert on, on transportation. I mean, on um, water, I, I do know a bit about transportation, um, uh, and, but we do have experts. I'm, I'm, I'm focused on the process and, and, and that's where we could really use your help, ma'am, that, you, you know, you, what, what can we do? You know, I'm not in office anymore, but when I was running for governor, I said, we have the highest the fifth largest economy at the time, now it's fourth, with the highest effective poverty rate. We take too long to build and it costs too much. And we could be a lot more pro-business in this city, in this county, in this state. And so from my vantage point, thank you. Um, from my vantage point, that's where I would really push. If we can accelerate these projects, cut the cost and the time, people, I saw this, that's how Measure M got passed. People saw, you know, I was, you know, right after I passed Measure R, you know, I did a, wanted to do a, what's it called? Like a celebratory tour. So I did all these town halls, all proud and, you know, 
thinking people were going to be happy with me because 70% of the people voted for it. And the first thing they said, where's your subway to the sea? <laughs> How, you know, I thought we, we, we paid for that. And I heard that again and again and again. And that's when I came up with the 3010 plan that was America fast forward. Cause I told my staff, well, they, they actually haven't, I said, one, they're screaming at me and they're upset. And I, I didn't understand why that was the case, but I have had tough questions in my life. So I just smiled when they did it, but they gave me an idea. Let's accelerate these projects, build 30 of the, build, build 30 years worth of projects in a 10 year period of time and show that it can be done. If we do that in this state, we're going to show uh, that a blue state, you know, progressive on our social values, but also smart and efficient in the way we engage this infrastructure. So thank you, Steve, again. Well, before we go, yes. uh, for for those of you who have been, have been on my panel before, I usually leave the hardest hitting question at the very, very end. So, Mayor, you've been council member, you've been uh, majority whip, you've been speaker, you've been mayor, um, and now you're stepping out of your private uh, sector life to, to do this public service again. What's next? <laughs> Astronaut, yeah, I like that. Um, hell, I'm gonna go work for you, man. <laughs> you know, I, I, I really mean it. I see Susie, I see so many of these young, idealistic uh, folks that worked with me, for me, alongside, and and you know, couldn't be prouder. And you know, I, I love public service. I think that's pretty clear. Um, I think the governor's folks were surprised that you know. I think at first, you know, I was going to do like two meetings or three meetings a day, and I said, I'm not used to that. You know, put six, put eight, and then I want a dinner afterwards. You know, it's like I'm used to intensity. Uh, with everything I do, I was in the gym at 4.45 this morning and um, I want to surf uh, and that I know I'll do. You know, you could do from the private sector. I think a lot of you are involved in, you know, community efforts and I think you can. But, um, you know, I don't know what the future holds, but uh, as I tell Susie when she calls me for my birthday 70s and new 40. <laughs> That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Right. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Mayor. Transitioning, transitioning into <laughs> the other role. I'm wearing my moderator now. Right now. Uh, thank you again, Mayor, um, for, for that insightful conversation. And thank you to all our speakers. Uh, and thank you, Donaji, Steve, Ron, uh, Shannon, uh, Dr. Hamilton, uh, and all our uh, speaker and panelists as well. And also want to thank our sponsors, our exhibitors, and all the, your the attendees for sticking with us. Some of you already know, and um, I, I like to leave this event by repeating some of the key takeaways from, um, from, from what we learned to, before. The 2023 LADC economic forecast showed us that we are in a very precarious time, and we can actually take action in terms of what our future is going to look like. And that's going to require the support and the partnership with all of you. As we laid out our, our plan and strategy for the five pillar approach, and as we had seen in this conversation, there's so much that we could and should do together, making sure that equity, making sure that diversity, making sure that sustainability uh, and, and inclusion is all included in our plan so that we can collectively uh, come together. The mayor mentioned another thing about rising tides of thought boats. And for some of you have heard it before. Rising tides lift all boats if you have a boat. If you don't have a boat, it might drown you. How do we make sure that we're able to build the boat and build the, the life jacket so everybody can rise together? We've seen and heard about the various effects in regional, state, and national ec economies, and we have had experts in their field take a closer look at three areas that can create a more equitable and sustainable recovery, transition of key industries, small business, and commercial real estates. It is our desire that the forecast we presented today will shed significant light on both the challenges and opportunities which lie ahead. We hope to enlighten and empower you to make more informed decisions in the year ahead and help us advance a more robust, equitable, sustainable, and resilient economy for all.
please join our efforts. Um, as we're moving forward again, there are all these amazing five pillar approach strategies that we'll be launching. The bioscience one, the Grow LA Bio Initiative will be launching and we're gonna be uh, reaching out to all of you for your partnership. So please consider joining us on this effort, join our board, join our committees. Um, and don't forget, we have a, a number of events that are coming up as well. I think we're gonna be showing some of those coming up as well. Um, Select LA, our International Investment Summit, which is focused on foreign direct investment, will be on April 27th in Pasadena. 80 City Summit, um, this is on May 23rd at, in downtown Los Angeles. And please uh, go to our website to download the report so you can get more information. On behalf of the staff and board of LADC, we want to thank you and invite you to keep doing the work of driving our economy forward and look to the LADC as a resource and community partner. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.